Okay, uh, thank you everybody. Thank you for the invite today um, for, uh, to speak. Um, uh, I guess I'll say a little bit about Platypus. So Platypus is a project for um, the reconstitution of a emancipatory politics of a left politics. Um, I've been in this project for a while. I mentioned I, was, I used to live down in Houston and now I live up in Philadelphia. Um, I'm sure there are details about where the reading groups are and coffee breaks are in, in the local area, and it sounds like people already know where some of them are. Um, but if you haven't had a chance to, you know, participate in a coffee break or a reading group or, um, you know, also our website, platypus1917.org, um, maybe another lecture we'll talk about why it's 1917, um, then I would highly advise everybody, if you're interested um, in this question of politics, and obviously that relates to greater things as we'll talk about today, like history and modernity. So I know the title for this today is Capital and History. And I hope to maybe raise a, a question about that that's really in a lot of ways a kind of um, what we would say is a, a dialectical question, meaning a self-reflexive question. Um, capital is something very, very, very new in human history. And so to say one finds it in history, and maybe even we were just talking about Karl Kautsky before we started, he has these texts where he finds it at the very beginning of human civilization. It's like the first thing. Um, it raises a, a question about how one um, is socially constituted, about a question of human freedom, about a question of freedom in history. And uh, hopefully in terms of raising that question today, we can also raise the, the other question about what is Marxism for, um, which is maybe very opaque today. I mean, maybe Marxism just seems like some wild philosophy and a very, you know, kind of eclectic combination of different things uh, that we could, you know, maybe do without, or maybe a very violent thing. I mean, sometimes that, that happens as well as soon as you start saying Marxism or socialism and people kind of look up like, uh-oh, there they are. Um, you know, hopefully instead we could uh, raise a, a broader question in that sense. So I'll start. This is not a lecture. Feel free to, you know, interrupt the whole time um, with different questions. And uh, I'll try to facilitate the discussion as we're, we're talking. So what is Marxism for? The usual answer is that it is, quote, scientific socialism, and that it will give the proletariat the, quote, science for revolution. But which science? Marxism? Marxism-Leninism? Marxism-Leninism-Maoism? Freudian Marxism? Quote, Western Marxism? To answer this, we really need to go back to why Marx and Engels ever became who they were. The story of Marxism really does not begin from a first principle, but begins rather with an ongoing story, an ongoing crisis. Marx and Engels are neither anti-enlightenment, nor do they simply build on the enlightenment in a progressive sense. Rather, as Louis Menant has described them, and maybe some of you are familiar with this passage from the reading group, uh, they are, quote, philosophes of a second enlightenment. But then that raises another question. What then was the first enlightenment? The image usually given is of some European man with a powdered wig and stockings, pontificating about rationalism, science, and individuality. Even more confusingly, because this image is usually labeled bourgeoisie, and one knows isn't Marx against the bourgeoisie, there is some received intuition of Marx opposed to this, even if he seems to genuflect towards certain figures. So somehow Hegel is kept out of this because he's cool enough to not fall into like, you know, being white bread uh, rationalism. Um, but this would confuse two things, bourgeois society and the Enlightenment. The former had been around for at least 300 years by the time the Enlightenment came about in the 18th century, and perhaps even more. Bourgeois society means urban society, or the society made up of those who work. About 10,000 years ago, a funny little animal decided to lay down a stake in the land and settle. It had grown tired of hunting for food and running away from danger. Instead of reacting to what nature brought her way, this new species began to imitate the seasons of nature. They started to plant agriculture and raise animals. This truly was a revolution. After mimicking nature down to the lightning that made a fire and the rotten fruit, so we got alcohol, 
uh, that you found, you also mimic those around you. Families as we know them did not exist, but rather you identified with everyone you had all held um, to have been descended from the same feathery creature you sometimes saw floating over the open terrain. So you'd be like, oh, that's my ancestor. If we went back very, very far, we somehow anamorphed out of that. Meeting the basic necessities of food allowed the community to defend itself from the past that was still floating around. So you kind of had nomads and hunt, you know, hunter-gatherers maybe warring. A caste of warriors grew atop the new social power. The basic precarity of the situation was such that the communities only were, so they only continued to be, this you know, first question in philosophy, to the degree that they could continue to exist. In this case, that meant the support of those who justified the existence of the order. The lower orders were little distinguished from a natural state. And in fact, they were potentially liable to at least fall back into nature, be like a beautiful thing. Right. There's even, I think Nietzsche has that uh, image in The Birth of Tragedy of the kind of myth of what's the worst thing to have ever been born, that it would be nice to kind of go back into nature and be pleasantly in oblivion. Um, and that was always kind of like right there, right? These communities were very precarious. Um, it therefore followed that what was good and true was that which persisted, that which is. To conquer was but the affirmation of the truth of the community. They were acting according to nature like beasts of prey. The concentration of social power on the central families made them go beyond. They became deified. You got godheads. They were demigods. Those who worked bore the mark of being conquered. Those who ruled spent their time not only administering politics, but also practicing the justification of their existence through culture. Sports played at warfare for bored aristocrats. Producing monuments practiced the domination of men. The godhead was the necessary form of social power. It was the fixation that prevented the Zun Politikon from falling back into nature. The community was held together through ritual, and in this, the early forms of spirit appeared. So just natural forms of religion. This was known as traditional society. Freedom here meant the freedom to be because what was ought to be reproduced. And I always think I bring up the Alexander Pope, the essay on man. All I know is that which is is good. You know, even though that's right at the edge of something I'll talk about in a few minutes, but it kind of gives a good image of, you know, what is true is good is that which has persisted. The point of life uh, was to make the world go round and reproduce the customs and habits of the world you were born into. There was not a question of what one ought to do, no dizziness of freedom. Among the ancients, the people was not, wrote De La Manet. What we call the people today, he's reflecting in 1839, were slaves. They were laborers, tillers of the ground, household servants, mechanics, sometimes even professors of the liberal arts, grammarians, poets, and physicians. Citizen, and in virtue of this title, invested with public functions, the free man governed, administered, and judged. So the people who were free from work were those who were judged in, in politics. Or exempt from all save domestic cares, lived idly on their own revenues or on the revenues of the state, the state providing for all citizens unable to support themselves. In living on the work of others, traditional society was relatively stagnant. It could only truly extend through conquest. There were inventions and there was cultural development, but they were constrained by the need to fix the preserved ordo, right? In other words, the divine chain of being you probably learned in middle school history, maybe middle school AP history. No, that's high school. Um, wealth as such was not the aim of the community, but rather that which strengthens and maintains the order, which produces virtuous citizens. It is very possible that this could have continued indefinitely. And just to stop for you know, a second, I remember being in, so my background's in economics, I remember being in an economic seminar and someone was talking about like the economy in traditional ancient society. And I might have been bored because I said, well, did you know productivity was like a vice in ancient society? And the whole room looked at me like I was insane. 
Um, because of course, our view of productivity would be like manna falling from heaven. And it's like, oh, bountiful harvest, isn't that a beautiful thing, right? More food, more riches, didn't the ancients like that? Uh, well, on the one hand, not quite, meaning only certain people were allowed to consume things. Um, but not only that productivity per se, which is something that we value today, I mean, literally read the Financial Times or The Economist and they talk about you know, stagnant productivity or growing TFP or whatever, um, that itself was experienced in a very negative manner because it kind of broke up the ordo. It threw things around in a way that wasn't fixed and established. It created chaos. And you know, in a lot of ways, um, a lot of early, uh, I guess the best way I could put it is pogroms, would be that the nomadic groups that lived in the interstices of different communities would show up and try to sell things, and they would sell to the wrong person. And they would mess up the whole order of everything. So the way we're going to deal with them is we're going to chop their heads off, right? Because they've ruined the community. Go ahead. Does that link up too with the kind of Aristotelian aristocratic feeling of like work being beneath freedom? Listen, and somebody correct me on this, but like uh, I know you'll be able to correct me on this, but uh, like Aristotle is like works of art are beautiful, but the person who produces the art is profane. I'm not an expert. Right? Meaning, okay, <laughs> meaning like the genius, like the art is beautiful, it's like a yeah, higher order, it's super sensible, but like to work with your hands, that was like profane and lame. So I think that's what you were kind of raising right there. That would be Katie who, who would be able to correct it. I don't, I don't, it doesn't sound familiar to me, but. Not familiar? It's, it, Hauser brings it up. So Arnold Hauser brings it up uh, in his volume one of his social history of art. And I believe it's Aristotle, it might be somebody else. But also it would make sense, meaning like the work of art is something that's reflecting something spiritual, and the person who's producing it, they're like an artisan, right? And so it's kind of like, it's a lower order of things. It's one of the reasons as well, like, um, you know, Rome collapses because when certain slaves would be freed, they actually, like, they either couldn't go and do the work that slaves did, or they couldn't really do artisanship because that was also considered kind of, it was looked down upon and not great. And that's why, you know, I was just reading the, the, the Le Manet, and I'm sorry my French is terrible, I only really speak English, um, that he, you know, is writing in 1839, like, obviously all these things that we value today um, were considered beneath a lot of the upper orders back then. And that's like part of the revolution, right? I know some of you are familiar with um, the Abbe Ciez, right? The third estate, like, oh, we're the real nation, like the people who work. Like that's a whole transvaluation in values that happened over many, many centuries, such that all of a sudden work came to have value. And before I continue, I'll give one more silly example. Um, I remember seeing the magazine cover. It was a Forbes cover uh, for Kylie Jenner. It's when she like became a billionaire at one time. And on the cover, it said, "I had to work for it." Now we all we literally know her life, like literally. There's a you know TV show about it, and obviously very successful parents. And yet even then, of course, Donald Trump says the same thing, right? It's a value to work for something, to be a self-made person, in a way that it wasn't the case in traditional society, and not just simply because they thought differently, but because in a way, work couldn't be given a social value. And that's why I brought up the, the productivity point, meaning productivity per se could not be grasped as a social value. Things could, yes, it was nice to have a lot of food and gold, but productivity? Any other thoughts or questions? Because the point then would be to produce the same things in the same amount as have always been produced and are necessary for the production of this social whole, right? Yeah, and if you had a really good harvest, you know, Adam Smith talks about this, then you would show off by having some gigantic party. Like, this is how great I am, right? It's like, you know, when we read Weber a few summers ago, and all of a sudden time is becoming money, and to be a rational miser, this is the way that Marx puts it in Capital, that it's like valuable to save, Abstinence is good. This is like, you know, some of the vulgar political economy. This is what savings is. When I used to teach undergrad finance, I would start the class by saying, what's finance? It's 
intertemporal exchange. It's the value of exchanging between periods in your life. These are all like, yeah, like they knew about finance, obviously, to some degree in, in different parts of ancient societies, but like per se, that savings is like a good thing because you're planning your life out. That's all new. You want to? No? Okay. When people put their hands up sometimes like that. <laughs> I, just, I, don't, I don't know if... Um, so, uh, to continue, and actually this you know, leads back to this. Um, in retrospect, when we look backwards, we see reasons that could lead to modern society. It seems even inevitable. Um, the stability of society uh, eventually created the ground for dynamicism. Uh, myth was but an early form of history. So you saw you know, the seasons were given a kind of mythical explanation. And not, an empire built on conquest and slavery eventually ran into a contradiction. This is uh, what I was talking about earlier, and Rome collapsed. Over time, the declension of ancient societies led to their dispersion and stratification of the ruler and ruled. Kings and dictators who ruled absolutely were compelled to grant power to local lords to protect them from invaders. So this happens under, I'm going to mispronounce this, Caesar Papalism, that they kind of, like, or after that, they had to kind of grant power um, to feudal lords to protect them from, say, barbarians invading. Like, okay, yes, if you make a military alliance with me, you can rule over your domain and take your revenue. Um, these lords in their territory were political actors into themselves. Um, around some time after the 10th century, there started to be a peculiar phenomenon. The monasteries that had preserved the artisanship that had been considered profane in the ancient world uh, turned into trading outposts. Right, that became like places where like, you know, and obviously it wasn't like we're a trading outpost. It's rather we're letting people come in because we're monks, we're good, we follow the word. Um, but in retrospect, it looks like that this is part of it. And obviously this is linked up with the Crusades. Um, in the cities, a new society was developing based, on primo, based not on primogeniture and conquest, so not on inheritance of your position in life, but rather on labor. Um, it was able, therefore, to respect beings in a new way. Um, so this is a quote from Anne Klein. I don't know much about her, but whatever this passage is that I accidentally found once, it's spot on, perfect, great stuff. It's out of a book on Buddhism. I don't have a specific interest in that, but this is a great passage. This developing sense of individual uniqueness and personal choice is reflected in changes in the meaning of the English words individual and self over the past five centuries. In the 15th century, individual meant indivisible. It could be used to describe the trinity, and she has a, like a Latin here that I'm not going to try to pronounce, like individual trinity, or a married couple who were individual not to be parted as man and wife. Since at least the 17th century, however, the term individual has emphasized the separateness of person rather than their connection. In the late Middle Ages in Europe, quote, self was a noun representing something to be denied in favor of God and all he represented. Only in 1674, writes Peter Abbs, following the Oxford English Dictionary, did self take on the modern meaning of a permanent subject of successive and varying states of consciousness. With this, the center of meaning was no longer situated in the wider external sphere in God, society, or nature, but came to rest more completely within the narrow bounds of the individual himself. The Protestant Reformation and the rise of capitalism combined to place persons in an individuated rather than a mediated relation to text and God just at a time when the development of a new class structure and the proliferation of land ownership encouraged the assertion of exclusionary boundaries, particularly between men. Consciousness, literally meaning to, to know with, took on its modern meaning of self-awareness in the 17th century. Numerous related terms also entered the language during this period. So self-sufficient, 1598, self-knowledge, 1613, self-made, 1615, that's a bourgeois one, right, I'm a self-made man. Self-seeker, 1632. Selfish, 1640. Self-interest, 1649. Self-knowing, 1667. Self-determination, 1683. Self-conscious, 1687. So why would this be the case in you know, the cities 
Um, so a lot of the cities, they were kind of, I guess the way I've put it in the past is, I, I put it as bombed out former uh, Roman Empire cities, but really they had been deserted in a lot of ways, meaning power was more on the countrysides. Um, as I was just talking about in terms of the feudal era, feudalism also being a bourgeois term, we'll talk about it a little bit, um, power was in the land side, it was in the, the nobility, and part of what started to populate the cities again were serfs or slaves who ran away and they ran into the cities. And what did they bring with themselves? Nothing but, and here's your favorite Marxist catchphrase, the labor on their back, right? Meaning, I think the, uh, the example I've given in the past, um, I have a sister. When I was growing up in, you know, we were growing up and we would do chores, we would exchange chores between each other. Like I'll do the dishes if you mow the lawn. Okay, you do the dishes two nights and I'll mow the lawn. Um, meaning what did the former serfs and former slaves have in those cities? Well, they all kind of did the same thing in the countryside. There was like a, a kind of home economy that was pretty similar. There wasn't much differentiation. You had to make clothes, you had to make food, everything like that. And so what they brought with them in, into the cities was a form of relating on the basis of work. But they kind of didn't have anything. And it actually made sense at the time, and we'll get to this at the end of the um, teach-in, uh, it made sense at the time to kind of exchange on the basis of labor. So the image that Adam Smith gives of you know the butcher, the baker, and the candlestick maker, you can imagine in the countryside, one person did all of it. And I think even Adam Smith talks about this in The Wealth of Nations. He says, um, in the countryside, they're like a jack of all trades. And he even says they talk different, and he talks about their hands. It's like a whole thing. I really recommend The Wealth of Nations. Um, but in the cities, one could become specialized. They could become interdependent in a way that was not realized hitherto. Obviously, there was always like, yes, we're going to break up a task or some, something like that. But to live on the basis of the exchange of labor, that's what was new that was emerging in, in urban society, in bourgeois society. Go ahead. Yeah. Why wasn't that in ancient urban society, that division it, of labor? Yeah, so one of the... So the classic thing that instantly comes to my mind, so there's always been like a division of work, right? I think even, you know, Marx talks about, um, it can't be Seneca. It would be somebody talking about how to farm, right? On, on the, like in the colonies. Um, and obviously, Pliny? It might, yeah, I think it is Pliny actually, yeah. Like in other words, oh, this would be the best way to do agriculture or something like that. Um, so to say the division of labor, the reason I would make the distinction is that one's rights and one's basis is following from that first property and labor. In ancient society, there was slavery. And so the kind of classic you know, example that Marx gives of Aristotle is that Aristotle couldn't solve the commodity form because he couldn't recognize slaves as being laborers, as free laborers. Right? They were kind of instruments because to kind of recognize them as laborers would be like, oh, this is wrong, this entire world that we live in. Right? In other words, in the Constitution, in the Declaration of Independence, the inalienable right, when Jefferson writes that, that's just the common sense of bourgeois society, that you can't alienate labor because it would be a contradiction. You would alienate your right to alienate. So one cannot voluntarily sell themselves into slavery because you would be contradicting your right to sell yourself. This is like a modern bourgeois conception. It's Locke. Right, that's Locke's argument. That's Locke's argument. Why there's freedom. Russo makes another argument where he's like, well, if you were a slave, you could kill somebody and not be responsible because you'd be somebody else's property. So those kinds of justifications, like in a way they couldn't make sense in ancient society because it would just seem to contradict the rationality of like ancient Greece. In other words, I think the example I sometimes give is to say a, a married bachelor. If I say that to somebody, they're like, that's a contradiction, a bachelor is not married. So if you were to say a, like a free slave, it's like, what are you talking about? a free laboring slave that just, they're not that then. And I think you raised as well earlier, um, the Aristotelian essence, their inner purpose was to be a slave, right? They were in the right position. 
Right? Your, your inner purpose was to be a person of the mind, a philosopher. Um, you know, the telos was to be, as opposed to, as I'll be getting to in a little bit, to become. Um, I'm trying to think of anything else. I mean, I guess there would have yeah. been non-slaves that were workers. Oh, yeah. So then, I, I guess I have the same question about division of labor in the ancient city. Yeah, no, so I was talking earlier about Rome collapsing on this basis, meaning slave vocate, like I was going to say a slave vocation, which is also improper. The jobs a slave did are not ones that a free man would go and do. That would be like degrading. It's one of the reasons why the freemen go and join the Teutonic barbarians at the end of, like in the declining eras of Rome. They like reach for them. I mean, that's not one of the, not the only reason, but there's one of the reasons. I mean, I wonder whether, um, so maybe there are two things, right? Um, because I guess, we know about the, like the escape from the countryside to the cities that um, kind of happens more and more frequently, right, and in more areas um, around the time when like the, the cities really come to kind of be the centers of wealth and of power, right? Mm -hmm. So I guess maybe partially it's a quantitative difference. Um, because of course, um, like cities, especially like cities as capitals, where you had a certain kind of population of tradesmen, trades, yeah, tradesmen, yeah. tradespeople, and workers around it. I mean, that has kind of persisted throughout history. Oh yeah. Yeah. But then maybe so I wonder whether it's like a quantitative difference, and then also like the other thing you mentioned, right? Um, the the big shift in. Um, like that we see in, in CS, right? But that would be the revolutionary consciousness that kind of emerges, right? This idea that to work for a living is not, is neither something that falls, uh, is not something degrading, but actually like you are part of the group of people who are the nation, yeah. the state. Um, rather than simply like a supporting role for like those who who are meant to lead and to govern and to administer in a way. Um, yeah, I don't know if that is helpful. Um, yes, but I would I would I would think that there's a difference in quantity, like how important the sort of division of labor that we see in the city is and then also like where in a way um, Can I yeah, go ahead. say something about this, which is that, um, so one, I mean, the slaves did not have right in, in labor in terms of like, you know, it's the John Locke thing that the first property is you mix your labor with the land. Um, and in terms of what Clara was just raising about like the quantitative aspect. So yes, to exchange according to labor, that, it's not like the first person who runs away. It's still like really, you know, the way they would put it is they're living organically and naturally. They're living in the same way that they lived in the countryside and now just in a new place. And it might have been like that for hundreds and hundreds of years. Meaning by the time you get to Siez, we're talking about the enlightenment of bourgeois society which had already existed for several centuries. And it's coming into being that someone can even reflect on such and say, look, they're existing on the basis of the exchange of labor. Obviously, C.S. is inspired by Adam Smith. We know this because when he wrote that pamphlet, we know he had Wealth of Nations sitting next to him. And the ability of Adam Smith to say, look, modern society is based on the uh, exchange of labor, right? That people are relating at a very abstract level, right? Like, they're not really. Society is being regulated not by the exchange of things, but the butcher, the baker, and the candlestick maker are regulating each other according to how they're useful in society. And to arrive at that level of abstraction as well means that it's not just the butcher, 
the baker, the candlestick maker in the cities, but such a great diversity, even an infinite diversity of labor is happening that it's giving rise to the conditions by which one can even say this is labor and it's not just work, which has always existed. And work, animals work, plants work, right? Bacteria work. They work, they produce things, but they don't relate on this basis. That's not like where one's personhood is following from. You know, I mean, people, look, I was hearing people talk about bodily autonomy the other day in Philadelphia. And bodily autonomy is like a new accomplishment, right? Because if I was in the state of, you know, if I was in nature, you think a tiger is going to respect my bodily autonomy? Hell no, right? We, we, I hope everybody in this room will respect my bodily autonomy, but I, you know, I would hope so because we have some kind of shared basis about what makes someone a human and a person, some kind of shared rationality of society such that even if you were to get up and beat me up for no reason, hopefully people would think that's a bad thing because it wasn't out of self-defense. Um, so th that's the quantitative thing. And I also was reminded of the fact that the term capital, so this is capital in history. Obviously, of course, we talk about the capital of a state as well. And that term used to be identical with the term wealth as well. I think this is what you're raising. So literally, like, the major city and wealth was one thing. And now I've been separated that there's like a designation of what the capital is of the state. Um, yeah. So that, yeah, go ahead. Sorry, but I just thought and this, I think, ties into something that you said before about like, labor power, right? So the idea that like not only yours, but everyone's, like the basis on which you are a member in society is like on the basis of the labor you contribute, right? That, that determines basically your membership and that determines right. everyone's membership rather than, um, you know, uh, kind of what, what group you were born into and what sort of obligations you inherited. I mean, of course, that doesn't just go away, but like the image of society as this weird, this sort of organization where like I have my membership on the basis of the labor I contribute. And yeah. that is true for everybody else as well. Yeah, labor as such, right? Because even to say like I'm a member of society on the basis of being a candlestick maker, yeah. that would be sub right. 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 But uh, I'm a person who contributes to society. That's my status. And right now I'm making candles, but I could go and make sheepskins and there's no difference. I'm just as much of a person regardless. Well, as much as a member of society. Right. Yeah. Well, same thing, right? Yeah. In a lot of ways, the word society is also a modern one. I know we talk about ancient societies and modern societies, but, uh, you know, I think of um, in the encyclopedia that Diderot and D'Alembert wrote, they say that the word sociable is a modern neologism. So to be a person liker is how they explain it. They're like, oh, that's like a modern thing that now it's a value just to like people, as opposed to whatever. That's why I like to distinguish it as community and society, even though it like starts to sound semantic. But it's like, um, you know, the freedom to be in ancient society was the freedom to be a Jew, freedom to be an Assyrian, freedom to be a Roman, right? Like you're to that community, whereas, uh, you know, I'll keep going, but one of the things that's been, that was articulated by the Enlightenment is the separation of civil society from the political sphere. Mm -hmm. Meaning those were kind of one in ancient society, so that to be a member of community was to have, you know, partake in the political activity, to vote, to decide when to go to war. And that in modern society, um, you know, I was just in London and Berlin. I don't have the right to vote there. But they respected my property there. They are actually very helpful. I lost something, somebody found it. They thought it was a good thing, meaning there's something about labor that's already cosmopolitan in itself. You're relating just on the basis of how one contributes and is cooperative, right? John Locke, his letter on toleration, um, he says like, you know, if you go down to the marketplace, you have Christians and Jews and Muslims and they're all trading, they're all cooperating. And so why is it that we're so, um, you know, uh, severe against dissension in terms of religious manners? Meaning he's reflecting on the fact that we already 
are cooperating by the time that he's writing the 17th century. He makes a similar argument on the basis of why is labor the first property. Nobody reads the first part of the treaties. Everybody knows the second part of the treaties. The first part is, well, if you say that you're the descendant of Adam and Eve, how do I even know anymore? Because the commercial world has made all sorts of different people meet each other and fall in love, I'll just put it like that, you know, to keep it PG-13, so we don't really know the, the line. Um, so, yes, it's not like the first few people that went into these cities instantly, it's the entire bourgeois world. This is a development over centuries and centuries, and then people being born into it, and even at the beginning, it was obviously still very um, feudal, meaning the guilds, the guilds acted like a landlord, they had a property on the skill, okay? If you wanna be a carpenter, you gotta be in our guild. I mean, you know, I got, I went to graduate school and got my graduate degree. I was literally brought into the guild of what my profession is, that they had a sign off, like, yeah, he's fine, let him in. Um, so even the development of bourgeois society, I think this is what you're raising, happened under very feudal, forms for centuries and centuries, that by the time we get to someone like Abby Siez, they're saying this has become irrational. It's obsolete, it's anachronistic. Um, I just wanted to say one other thing, which is that, now I've said the two terms, feudal and civil society. So family feud, a fight between feuds, I mean families, it's a feud. So the term feudal is a bourgeois term. So when they say feudal society, they're saying a society that exists on fighting and conquering. Whereas we have a civil society. They feud, we're civil. They fight, we get along. We cooperate, they fight. Right? Like, if I was to ask the Duke of Saxony, is this feudal society, he'd be like, what are you talking about? And don't talk to me, also. <laughs> like, I have to say to one of my um, or something. Okay. So this account of the emergence of humans was, for bourgeois society, not just their justification, but the task that they set themselves. They posed a question. Man was born free, but in chains everywhere. Those chains were formed by him. One was self-enslaved. They were necessary to prevent man from falling back into nature, but in being self-enslaved, estrangement meant no longer from God, but from ourselves. This recognition was only possible on the basis of bourgeois society. So if you're just thinking about even the, the equalization that's happening in those cities, like yes, there are still guilds, but you're really reducing everything down to labor. It's actually raising a question of what is a human even? And I always bring up that Adam Smith says the Lords treated the burghers, the bourgeoisie, as if they were an entirely different species. And you know, it's why it's interesting to read somebody like, a, like a, um, a James Stewart, who was an aristocrat, he writes a little bit before Adam Smith, who tours around and sees like bourgeois cities, and he thinks though it's like a zoo to him. It's like a whole nother thing. It's a whole nother world. There, it, it's like, there's really a qualitative break. He's like, they think in a whole different way, they calculate in a whole different way. Um, I'll, I'll keep going, but this will come up more. Um, as Immanuel Kant wrote in 1784, therefore they were not living in an enlightened age, but rather the age of enlightenment. They were becoming enlightened about what had just happened the, the preceding several centuries. Um, for Kant, this was man's self-emancipation from his self-incurred tutelage. It's very Rousseau point. The whole question of what is a human was posed in a manner that it had never done before. Perhaps it was the first time the question of human was ever posed. To be radical, as Marx reminds us, is to grasp the root, and the root of modern society is man. This view does not originate with Marx, but he rather inherited from the Enlightenment's bourgeois radicals. Their response to the question of humanity was to ask, how do humans come into being, and what does it mean that we are asking that question, especially now? In this sense, there are not enlightenment values or even enlightenment rationality, but rather there was an en enlightenment of the society that had come into being. Hence, Adam Smith writes, a revolution of the greatest importance to the public happiness 
was in this manner brought about by two different orders of people who had not the least intention to serve the public. To gratify the most childish vanity was the sole motive of the great proprietors. The merchants and artificers, much less ridiculous, acted merely from a view to their own interests and in pursuit of their own peddler principle of turning a penny wherever a penny was to be got. Neither of them had either knowledge or foresight of the great revolution which the folly of the one and the industry of the other was gradually bringing about. So that's in Wealth of Nations. And so Smith is saying there was a great revolution in humanity, a crisis of such, that didn't happen with any kind of conscious foresight. It happened totally out of greed, totally out of vanity, perhaps. Maybe not literally completely out of greed and vanity, but it could have been led by such. It was people running away. Maybe they chopped off the head of their lord and then ran away. I don't know. Um, in a city, maybe they were just simply seeking profit, all of these bad vices. Maybe they were simply seeking you know, commercial outlets, um, all sorts of things like that. And they created a new possibility for emancipation. And the very character of that emancipation was such that it couldn't remain contained in the city. Right? So going back to the cosmopolitan character of labor, it like had to spread. And it obviously had an influence on the uh, feudal lords, so a lot of them became bourgeoisified. So maybe they kept their titles, but like they started to trade. And Adam Smith has a great thing where he's like, their minds literally changed. He's like, because they're going from simply like, yeah, give everybody all the food and we'll have like a nice party at my, you know, I don't know, notable land or something, it'll be cool. All of a sudden that becomes a loss. All of a sudden there's like profit and loss. And it's like, no, 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 don't, you know, give away all the food because I can go sell that in the cities or something like that. Or I can sell that and then get, you know, tools and handicrafts from the cities and then become more, you know, develop agriculture out here. Everything gets transformed um, from that basis. So I say that because I think when people hear bourgeois society, they think like Europe. Like, yeah, it begins in Europe, but actually bourgeois society and Europe are not the same thing, believe it or not. This is behind a lot of, it's Western, it's bourgeois. No, bourgeois city, it's urban. A lot of Europe was trying to kill bourgeois society for centuries and centuries. No, bourgeois, bourgeois society. So why is it that there could be a revolution that could come about from you know, these artisans and merchants who didn't care about anybody but themselves? Well, because in the practice of an exchange, two parties respect each other as property owners. For the exchange to happen, the consent of both properties, parties is required. Anything else is theft. I mean, when we think about the basis of human rights today, bodily autonomy, the right to my property. The point is that this was already happening in bourgeois society, maybe unconsciously so. Because what was happening in exchange, especially as it became more regular, is people were respecting each other's liberty. And they were respecting each other's freedom. And they were actually equalizing as well. Meaning in you know, the butcher coming over to the candlestick maker and saying, let's exchange, they were equalizing themselves as simply a part of society. Yes, we're all members of society. And so this is, then became the basis for even you know, modern political rights as well. Like, on what basis do you have a right to vote? Well, as a member of this society, the only justification for the government would be to uphold your rights. Right? This is the kind of John Locke point. And so consequently, uh, your political right follows from that inalienable right of being a laborer. Hence the term political economy, which was the politicization of the economy. So you can think someone like Adam Smith was politicizing the economy, saying what is the kind of ends and purpose and uh, what would it mean for uh, that kind of society to be true to its imminent potential? If these people are already respecting each other as free um, in a certain sense, uh, to violate that would be to go against its very principle. So Adam Smith could not only explain why there was political economy and thus himself, but he could give a kind of task to his age that, look, these merchants and artisans 
are tasking us with making good on this possibility. Otherwise, it would be worse, right? In other words, we would get what we were just talking about, which is a kind of like feudal economy, like guilds and things, or the landlords become their own merchants. And then it's like a contradiction between practice and, I don't know, the judicial uh, practice. I don't know, the, the civil practice and the judicial practice. It wouldn't line up. It would be wrong. Um, Right, so political economy, politicization of the economy, it drew out the inner telos of a society that developed on the interdependence of trade. From then on, the organization of life gained new purchase. Man's inalienable right became the first property of labor. Exchange was no longer accidental, but rather gained necessity. So just to put it in another way, maybe if we were to go back 5,000 years, they were not exchanging labor. That would be the provocative way I would put it. They exchange things, there's always been trade, but they weren't bourgeois individuals exchanging their property. It became a form of social cooperation, a manifestation of the will of not just those involved, but also society at large. So in an exchange, not just you and the person you're exchanging with are interested, but also society now has an interest in what's happening. Right? It's why I have an interest in I don't know. I, I don't have any pets, but like I have an interest in the production of pet food being as productive and profitable as possible because whatever savings are there will go through the entire economy and the entirety of society. That was not always the case, and I think this goes back to the earlier question about slave work and freemen's work. It was almost as if they were two different societies. They couldn't they were like two different qualities. They couldn't relate on that basis, right? In other words, the, the slave work was really for like the uh, family that owned them and then for the military. But there wasn't like productivity gains exchanging throughout the economy. I can almost, okay, so um, prior to bourgeois society, trade was associated with a class of people, medics. Right, with a T. Uh, now the very essence of man, their creativity, their purpose, their freedom, shone through the formerly profane act. Art itself experienced its renaissance in a world where day-to-day -day life was not organic and immediate, but rather involved one regularly considering their activity mediated with a whole. Thinking became more speculative to the mass of people. So I'm just following right there, this is kind of Arnold Hauser's point about you know, the Renaissance happening in the, the city states um, when trade is expanding as well. You can think that people's day-to-day -day activity, it's no longer just me and my family or the people I, um, I'm serving, but you're thinking about society as a whole. And so you know, he kind of speculates that that even opened up the development of the kind of speculative faculty of people. I Meaning their day-to-day -day what you're doing, you can think about how it's or you're being compelled to think about how it's connected with the world more at large. Um, and so it could be a, a, a burst of creativity there. That society had come into being had a profound effect on the very conception of philosophy. Philosophy's proper terrain seemed to shift not from what is, but rather what could become. The truth of being, as Hegel showed, was becoming. Man recognized that even the most basic understanding of the world was not passive, but involved the web of relations of man to the world. That there was a so-called subject-object relation. One didn't just see an apple, but gave form to the object that is an apple. There is something desired in making something intelligible. You're comparing it you know, to this ideal of what an apple is. It was fraught with oughts in that sense. Hegel's famous phrase that the owl of Minerva flies at dusk, that is, that wisdom comes to us after the fact, is but a self-account of the very reason for Hegel and the bourgeois radicals. What is usually called the bourgeois revolution, so this, we were just talking about this connected series of like the Dutch Revolt, English Revolution, American Revolution, French Revolution, is really the end of the result. All right, so bourgeois society predates it, and the Enlightenment's kind of at the end. As Marx put it, the form went beyond the content. Emerging still out of traditional society, they could only make this revolution by appealing to antiquated forms. 
Only afterwards could they come into their own or supplant Habakkuk with Locke. The conflation of bourgeois society and the Enlightenment is related to another conflation, bourgeois society and capitalism. The two terms are not only temporally different, but categorically so. Capitalism was for Marx the crisis of bourgeois society. The Industrial Revolution, which had begun in the late 18th century, but whose full effects were only realized in the 19th century, had undermined the still emerging bourgeois society. Right? It's not like we get the whole world becomes bourgeois and then it happens. And maybe in a lot of ways the, um, what's the term I'm thinking of? What upsets people is that by the time the bourgeois revolution might come to them, it's already in crisis. And it's maybe experienced as a crisis from the very beginning. I mean, obviously, we talk about this today, imperialism. right? In other words, we're already getting the crisis for bourgeois society. At the most general level, the crisis is one of time, a self-contradiction of how to measure or judge what matters. This is experienced as an injustice. And this is why we're relating about a society based on work society based on the exchange of labor, the comparison of labor, the reduction of society down to time, labor time. And so if that measure was to collapse or to become undermined, distorted, it's experienced like, oh, this is exploitation, or this is stealing, this is oppression. Because this undermines the social standard and thus any form of cooperation, People are led to try to fix things politically. Democracy was the result. The question that always has to be asked and is never asked, and that's why I'm asking it, is why does democracy become necessary? We can consider the phrase proletariat, citizens without property. Marx did not invent the use of the term, but it was used by socialists of his time. For the word is both true and false. The modern working class does have property. They have their inalienable right, labor. And yet, the ability to realize such seems impossible. And so it seems like it's estranged from me. My rights are taken from me. If you can't realize yourself in civil society, what other right do you have? You have your political right. Hence democracy. In other words, I'm going to write things. I'm going to write the injustice of society, the exploitation of the money grubbers and all the phrases we know, the parasites. They're leeching off of me. They're exploiting me. I'm going to seek the political rights to write this. Right? Go ahead. And this is different from the democracy that would have prevailed in, like, Athens. Yeah. I mean, it's on a totally different basis. Even though... Well, I mean, I'm thinking that to someone like um, Constant, right? Yeah. Like that it seems like it's the recrudescence of maybe something ancient that was outmoded. So with Constant, so Blaine's making reference to um, the speech that Constant gives in 1819 of um, the liberty of the ancients versus the liberty of the moderns. So he's most directly reflecting on, and obviously Hegel does the same thing in the philosophy of history and philosophy of right, on... Uh, the kind of um, anachronistic forms that were still there in the French Revolution. It's their kind of explanation for, I don't know, the Jacobins trying to realize the ends of the French Revolution as they tried to, as he puts it, turn France into like Sparta. Right? And he really means like a uh, San Just and how San Just is like abusing Rousseau. Like everybody called on Rousseau at that time. Um, so yes, democracy in ancient Greece, ancient Rome, ancient societies was to be a citizen, and usually that meant being born into that, right? Because it was one of these things that to vote you had to be a property owner, and then the question was like, well, how do you become a property owner in ancient society? You've inherited it, or you conquered it. Hmm. You didn't really have that many options. Whereas. In capitalism, the vote becomes exactly what you have when you don't have any property or you don't have any other way to... It's, it's what people relied on. So it's like, um, you know, when, when universal suffrage is first realized in 1848, it's realized it's like the proletariat is forcing the question on everybody because they're trying to deal with the problem of unemployment in civil society. 
and so they're demanding their political rights. And because they demand their political rights, all the other interests of society have to get involved as well. That's the passage when Marx says revolutions are the locomotives of history, this kind of famous one. It's from a paragraph where he's talking about how everything has to become political all of a sudden as a function of that crisis. Yeah. And that's why I, I said citizens without property, and I was talking about what justification is there for um, suffrage. Like, yeah, the bourgeois society almost relies on the same thing. Yes, to be a property owner, and then to become a citizen of that, that sovereign, to become a denizen. Um, you know, that would be the path to uh, realizing your, your political right. And uh, it is based on property again, but it's based on a different property. Or to quote my friend Rosa Luxemburg, good friend of mine, as she puts it in 1899 at the Hanover Congress, she says, the burghers in the cities revolted against the landlords in the countryside by creating a new property called labor. So their property was based on land. That's how she puts it. Your great, great, great uncle conquered that area, and he was a lieutenant, and it's been passed down. That's why your family has the crest and everything. You're tied to that land, right? Like you can't like sell the land. Oh yeah, mom and dad, I'm gonna get a new job. I'm gonna be a, you know, whatever. No, no, you're, that's, that's it, that's your position. Um, and only in bourgeois society, when property is becoming to be recognized as labor, yeah, all of a sudden the landlords maybe do they actually become landlords, is maybe a better way to put it. Um, the feudal lords become simply landlords. That's like a very Adam Smith way of putting it. That like, you know, the Duke of Saxony is like, I'm a Duke of Saxony, and Adam Smith's like, you're just a landlord. That's a very bourgeois thing. And again, coming back to my, my earlier point about the crisis of bourgeois society is experienced as an injustice, when the working class say we're exploited, right, these kind of terms, they're repeating the revolt of the third estate. This is why they're reaching for Adam Smith. They're saying, well, the capitalists, all you do is you steal our labor. They're actually replaying out that kind of like revolution again and again and again. Could you speak a little bit to um, yeah. the, I mean, the question of, I guess, universal suffrage um, and how in you know, most of Europe, I guess, that comes out of 1848, or, I mean, in the UK, like, it comes out of the sort of similar pressures, even if there's not the same kind of revolutionary moment. But I guess, I mean, this might be a superficial reading, but it seems to me like universal suffrage in the United States came out of a somewhat different context, in that it seemed like, it, you know, kind of prefigured the contradictions of capitalism, being, like, acting as a massive social pressure in the way, whereas in Europe, it seems like, I don't know, the demand for universal suffrage as you were saying, sort of came as a result of the perception that there's something unjust about, you know, the, about capitalism? So, uh, you know, the first major, uh, like the Jacksonian era, like we already have capitalism and that's when we really get like the first like mass voting party in America. Um, so it is reflecting actually yeah. the, the kind of problem already. I mean, I know there's like a letter that I like to throw at people where Thomas Jefferson says, look, I'd be even for allowing voting if you're just in that place for a certain amount of time. So, you know, they always have these justifications, whatever land, something like that. And Jefferson in the letter is like, I'd be fine and I tried to push it through that if you're just in the area for a while, you get the vote and that that town or something like that. I mean, the thing is, and this is why you brought up the constant, voting was not considered the realm of freedom. That's just like not where freedom is happening. It, like this is why Rousseau's like the best state would be that where like nobody really votes. They meet once a year and thumbs up and I'm gonna go do, live my life. Like why would one wanna get involved in that? Um, and so that's the kind of sentiment that's there at the founding of the, uh, modern American state. That's why George Washington is saying, don't get involved in partisan politics. And we've had this revolution, like we've learned from the past, and don't get involved in intervening in foreign nations, and don't fall into like politics. Like this is what, this is maybe the, um, this is the seductive character of the term democracy, right? Like. Every communist in the world will say, well, what is democracy? It's the people, it's the demos. Um, and yet we know from 
Frederick Engels, in response to Edward Bernstein, he writes a letter. He's like, well, the demos has meant very different things in different places. I mean, democracy in ancient Rome was like, yeah, the people, that's not the workers. That's like those who get to vote. Um, and so that it's reaching this kind of full point where you know, the demos is now becoming anybody. It's becoming people who can't even work, who don't even have the ability to realize their property in bourgeois society, which would make no sense to an Adam Smith or a George Washington. Thomas Jefferson, when he writes about Virginia, he's like, we don't have unemployed because anybody can get a job. And Adam Smith like, cannot even imagine. Everybody is useful for him. It's a beautiful thing for Adam Smith. And when I used to teach undergrad economics, I would just say, I bring up this, I, I promise I'll return to your question, I bring up like building a boat. And Adam Smith is like, that's an infinite like possibility for human freedom. Because you can always break down like, oh, okay, we just had one person building a boat. But we can have someone who paints it and then somebody else constructs it. And then the person that's painting it can study like different paints and they can go to art school. And then that opens up a whole nother sphere. Meaning Adam Smith can just read infinite possibilities out of something as straightforward as that, such that everybody will always be valuable. To quote Martin Luther King, labor has dignity. That's a very Adam Smith thing. That's very bourgeois cosmos kind of thing. So when that measure collapses, that's like literally experienced as this is wrong. The way that Thomas Hodgkin, a Ricardian socialist, puts it is that our rights have been usurped. There is a conspiracy of the capitalists with the government. I mean, Proudhon, property is theft, which doesn't make any sense. But he's like, no, literally, there's a conspiracy that is preventing the rights of humanity from realizing themselves. So to come back to this question of, of democracy, we have a certain, you know, now in capitalism, we have a certain attachment to democracy because it's like, I, I'll give you an example. Um, and I'm not saying give up your democratic rights, no. Like, you know, you know, the whole Lenin thing is like, we're gonna realize democracy to overcome democracy, okay. I, if you just kind of ask people about, well, why do we need our, our rights, the, the democratic rights, someone will immediately say, well, if we don't have them, like, the boss will screw us over, or the capitalists will screw us over, or Jeff Bezos, or the Apple, or whatever. Like, there's instantly, like, oh, there are monopolies in civil society that are going to screw you over and exploit you. Meaning everyone just naturalizes capitalism, and that's why we have democracy. And so that's why I kind of bring up that point. Um, and that's why for someone like, you know, the earliest article that I know by Engels saying the word proletariat, he's talking about England, he's talking about the Chartists, and he's like, this is the weirdest thing I've ever seen. The like unemployed have organized themselves into a political movement to like take state power. Right? Like usually past revolutions were like, yeah, the unemployed were organized or like the rabble, but they were like organized by some demagogue just to like get power. So what was new was that, you know, the unemployed, they are bourgeois. Workers are bourgeois. And that they were realizing their rights. They weren't being like treated as a mob. They were in a sense self-organizing themselves and literally pulling pastors off the pedestal to give charters to go give to the House of, you know, go give to Parliament. Um, and that was like unusual, and that was what was new. And that's why, you know, Engels, I'll come to your point in a second, but um, that's what was like new, that there was like a political movement like this, and it's kind of like, Marx is kind of like this at the beginning. His first response to the communist is he's like, oh, like the third estate, they want to make themselves everything. Right, it's the Abbey CEO's thing. And it looks like this crazy like democracy thing. Like they're just like full democracy everywhere. Um, and so Marx and Engels' response to that is not to be like, oh, that's good. They're like, that's a symptom of a crisis from the very beginning. Go ahead. Yeah, um, I guess relating to what you were just saying, um, it seems like the creation of the proletariat does something that changes the, the meaning of bourgeois that makes Marx end up writing in the Communist Manifesto that there are two great classes opposed to each other, the proletariat and the bourgeoisie, right? Um, 
and yet what you just said is that the proletariat is bourgeois, mm -hmm. right? So it, it seems as though the term bourgeois has changed. The proletariat is bourgeois in a pre-capitalist way, right, and not in a post-capitalist way. Would you would you say that that's accurate? Uh, to the last point first, I would say both. I mean, proletarian demands are bourgeois demands that are driving bourgeois society beyond itself. Um, the proletariat, look, the working class proletarianizes itself by pushing its bourgeois demands. So I, I uh, have written about this in other cases, but like the people driving the industrial revolution who undermine bourgeois society, it's women, it's children, former slaves, they're pressing their bourgeois rights and actually that's pushing this process that's happening that I'm not gonna go into too much detail right now, but it actually is undermining bourgeois society on a totally bourgeois basis, and that's why it's a self-contradiction. Um, you mentioned the term that in the Communist Manifesto they say like, um, the bourgeoisie like, seems to become a class. So, you know, this is like a necessary misrecognition. So Liebknecht, who's, uh, who becomes friends with Marx and Engels in the 1840s, and you know, it's later part of kind of SPD, and his son is Karl Liebknecht, who's murdered in 1919 along with Rosa Luxemburg. Um, he writes a pamphlet, No Compromises is what it's called. It's like a classic agitational pamphlet. And he says, when we say bourgeois, we mean all of the urban dwellers. And he says what, what has happened is that the bourgeoisie have been compromised by capitalism, is the way that he puts it. Um, like in other words, in 1848, the liberals, uh, they compromise on their own revolution. It's not like you get a bourgeois revolution. They're afraid of carrying it forward because the class struggle is undermining the, uh, how do, I, how do I put it? I don't want to say the ends of the revolution so much as it's undermining their relationship to the revolution, right? So this is this is the meaning of the fact that they um, that they have an alliance with the former feudal lords. Like that, for Marx, is showing that they're compromised because their sworn enemies, the feudal lords, the people they guillotined, right? Like forty years prior, they're now more uh, comfortable with them than they are with the proletariat pushing its bourgeois rights. And that's the kind of famous phrase in the 18th Brumaire of, if you're going to fiddle at the top, don't be surprised if people dance at the bottom. I mean, if you're going to talk about the republic and then the proletariat is pushing its rights, don't be surprised. In terms of the proletariat being bourgeois and beyond bourgeois society, obviously to have nothing but the labor on your backs to sell, that only exists in bourgeois society. That doesn't exist in traditional society, right? Like, Period. There's, there's none of that. You weren't even allowed to sell your labor. Well, you can, oh, by landlord, I'm going to go sell my labor. No, get back here right now. You can't do that. Um, in terms of pushing bourgeois society beyond itself, um, basically what happens, and I'll, let me see if I can try to summarize parts of capital in a second. <laughs> the butcher, the baker, and the candlestick maker. They're relating to each other on the basis of work. Their activity is abstracting. What does a butcher have in common with a baker? Simply the fact that they're laboring. Right? One of them's working with beef jerky, one of them is making a cake. Multiply that infinitely, you're literally producing the condition of abstraction. In Adam Smith's time, that activity started to make its way into the factory itself. Right? So Adam Smith. Chapter one of Wealth of Nations, the great manufacturers. He's right on the cusp of the Industrial Revolution. It's kind of ongoing, but the effects of it have not manifested themselves. In the factories, the workers are regulating each other, famously in the kind of pin making thing, where we're like all in a line, and we're regulating each other according to time. We're becoming, as Marx puts it, a machine. So it's not that machines were invented and this screwed everything up. The workers are already a machine. Their cooperation is the machine. At that moment in Adam Smith's time, the famous phrase, the separation of the means of production from the producers, right? Like you've all heard it. It's even mentioned in the Seinfeld episode. You've all heard it. That had not happened. Why had that not happened? The workers did own the means of production. 
because they own their skills, they own their labor, right? They were regulating each other. In the fight over the working day, in the Industrial Revolution, what had happened was the working class politicized their cooperation, right? And I was also talking about people joining this, this process. It's like young, it's like young women, it's like 12-year-old women who are pushing the Industrial Revolution because they're pushing the industrial, the uh, you know, machinery in the factory, they're simplifying the processes. That's why Marx just spends all of these pages talking about like, all of, you know, it's, it, Engels talks about this, about a 12 year old girl kicking her parents out of her house, because she's the breadwinner. What are you doing? You don't do anything. I'm the breadwinner. Right? It's like, Engels, nowhere in history has this ever happened. It is happening. That's why industrialization was considered effeminate at the time. So they're politicizing their cooperation as labor qua labor against the employers. And in that process, they had objectified labor and they had created the opportunity of detaching their own means of production from themselves as producers. So, you know, I don't know if you ever read Capital, chapters 13 through 15, that's the way in which there is a crisis of labor time the crisis is driven by the workers themselves. And one way to put it is that for Marx, it's almost as if there are two kinds of time now. There's labor time and there's machine time. Um, there's a book that recently came out that I was just talking to some of the sublation people with. So this is like Doug Lane and Ashley Frowley called Trade Wars or Class Wars. And it's by a guy named Michael Pettis who just retweeted James Vaughn for some reason. <laughs> Great. James Vaughn's a Platypus member. Michael Pettis is like a famous economist. He's on CNBC all the time, hmm. right? And he wrote this book basically about how the trade surplus and trade deficits, if you guys are nerds and read Financial Times or something like that, China's had a trade surplus, America's had a very large trade deficit for a while, that for him, it's really like a world in which this problem, and Germany has had like no trade deficit, has like a, I forget the German term, but it's like very balanced budget of like exactly trying to balance, that these kind of places in the world are sort of, this is how Michael Pettis puts it, mutually presupposing each other. Meaning the neoliberal era has been one where America has become like, you know, importing, right? This is linked up with the Rust Belt, this is linked up with Trump, American carnage, that China has been the manufacturer of the world, the assembler of the world, um, and this is also during the period of the EU and this kind of balanced budget. And the reason I'm bringing that up is because the kind of perpetual trade deficit and trade surpluses, again, in Adam Smith's time, in, in a David Hume time, David Hume wrote a little bit more about trade, that would make no sense because for them, trade would balance out over time simply through exchange. Whereas we completely naturalize that you have like export-led growth or you're maybe like a country that imports everything, like the US. And the reason I bring that up is because of course the supply chains that are running through all these countries, that's the industrial revolution that's running through the bourgeois forms of the American nation, of Germany, of France, of China, of Vietnam, of Malaysia. And the distortion in the trade flows is reflecting the fact that that's our measure of grasping the industrialization, different parts of the supply chain in kind of bourgeois forms, in, in like a bourgeois measure of time. So this is why Ireland, for example, has had enormous trade exports out of nowhere. Does anybody know why this is the case? No. Nope. Because the United States multinationals uh, have their final good in a whole value chain exported from Ireland so that they can avoid taxes. So this is why you've seen these ginormous jumps in uh, exports out of Ireland, um, uh, the Netherlands. Uh, you know, it's why the US actually produces way more than is even on record, meaning a lot of US companies specifically are adjusting which part of their supply chain falls in which country. And so that's why the US is like exchanging to China, 
to exchange back to the US, to exchange back to China, to go to Vietnam, to go to England, to come back to the US. That's all one thing, right? That's like the production of an iPhone or something like that. So back to the point about the crisis of time, um, that's already apparent in Marx's time, and actually before he, he's around, that the butcher, the baker, and the candlestick maker are sort of more truly inter independent. They truly are exchanging labor, whereas today, we relate as if we exchange labor, whereas that's been anachronistic for like 150 years. 200, basically. Right? It, Mar it, Marx just says this first chapter of Capital, and I think people skip it, when he says, if I told you that that shirt is, you know, the expression of labor, he's like, the absurdity is self-evident. Because obviously it's fucking machines, and it's going through all these different things. It's maybe coming out of Vietnam, who knows? And yet, when you bought that shirt, you related as if you were the butcher, the baker, and the candlestick maker. You relate in a bourgeois way, and we produce in an industrial way. But what do we exchange then, if we don't exchange labor? Well, we exchange like a, it's kind of like a crisis ridden society, right? This is why democracy is like stepping in to try to readjust things after the fact. Yeah, we relate in an anachronistic form of social relations. Yeah, we, we exchange labor, but the potential of industrial society bursts through that measure all the time. The potential being that we, we could have society and we could have something that would not fall, um, how do you say, that would not fall beneath bourgeois society, but right. that would no longer require the, like relating to one another on the basis of the exchange of labor, at least not in the way that, that it used to. Right. Yeah. So la labor itself is becoming increasingly unnecessary because of the Industrial Revolution. I, we were talking about Karl Kautsky before uh, this started, class struggle. Karl Kautsky just says the possibilities of labor are limited, the possibilities of capital are unlimited. Mm -hmm. So maybe this actually goes into the, the namesake of the teaching, the capital in history. So what was capital for Marx? It was a contradiction because it was precisely, as you were just saying, that potential refracted through bourgeois social relations. So capital is a critical category. And that's why Marx is very like, you know, into how the bourgeois political economists describe it. Oh, it's just past labor, they'll say. Right? Because like, yeah, if I want to start a business, aren't I advancing money and machines and stuff like that? And, you know, Marx would make fun of that because he'd be like, well, uh, if capital is just tools and implements, then like, you know, what about the hunter-gatherer who has like the bow? Is that capital? You know, or your arm, right? If you go to the gym, isn't that dead labor? You worked up your arm? Capital. Isn't that capital? Um, you know, is it money? Well, money's always existed. So he was kind of running through how the crisis in political economy was giving form to this kind of question around capital. And that's why even the phrase capitalism, which is not capitalistism, but capitalism. So it, it should be like an absurd term. And not absurd just for like the fun of it, like it, as if it's surrealism or something, but rather that it's the absurdity is expressing the need to transform society, as you were mentioning earlier, meaning Capitalism, uh, well, isn't capital property? So to say the rule of property, but people own property. So what does it mean to say something like the product owns the producer? That would be in a program in the Second International. Like it's there in the SPD's program, it's there in the RSDLP's program. Overcome blind necessity, the rule of the product over the producer. It's an absurd thing. You're not saying like literally the product has gained political rights and is, you know, smacking you or something. It's that it seems to be the case because the basis upon which that was supposed to res reflect your objectivity, your being, your social being, um, instead has broken down and it seems to be as if one desperately clings to any kind of means of social objectivity whether it's in the vote or it's in the demand to be exploited, right? The Joan Robinson thing, that it's better to be exploited than not exploited at all. So, yeah, I mean, in terms of the, the labor thing, like, that's what's implied. It's implied, you know, 
the superfluity of labor implies the overcoming of that. And that's why you get the, the phrase that seems unbelievable to people that work would become life's prime want, which instantly people think about themselves now and going to their job and they go, I don't want to, that sucks, right? And it's like, no, it would be a qualitative transformation of everything then. Maybe also a, a need. Maybe a need, yeah. I don't know what I, a future I mean, society would look like. Life's prime one, like the dark, I guess the dark image to that is un, like unemployment, right? Yes. There is just not enough work to go around. Yes, which is also, and it's, it's kind of absurd. Like the reason I bring up Smith is that it's absurd that there's not enough work to go around. And that's why, I don't know, I, this is like something my uncle would say. He'd be like, oh, pick up a broom. Right? He just thinks you can get a job wherever, like you just walk in, yeah, I'll sweep the floor. Maybe that's not worth it, I don't know. Like, no, it's, it's too expensive to have somebody sweep the floor. Um, and even if we could employ everybody, it still wouldn't deal with the crisis of, of time, which manifests itself in all sorts of ways. It manifests itself in the authoritarianism of the state. Meaning, you know, if people are going to try to fix things in civil society through politics, through coercion, you know, like all of the standard critiques that like were there in ancient Greece and ancient Rome, oh, it's going to be mob rule. It's not like Marxism disagrees with that. That's what happens in 1848. It is kind of mob rule. The proletariat is put down on the basis of mass democracy in 1848. I think Marx has this image of um, all of France holding their hands in order to uh, kill the June insurrectionists. So everybody gets together, they hold their hands, and they go, yes, kill the Reds in Paris, because they're messing everything up. It's like democratic. An act of love. It's an act, yeah. <laughs> okay. So, just a. Uh, I was going to read a little bit about the, um, how much time do we have? Sure. It's now 2.30. Okay, so I'll try to run through this a little bit. Where was I? I'm, never... I'm, I'm kind of curious how the, the St. John's students are receiving this, right? I, you know, I'm not a student of St. John's, but what I've been given to understand is that like the idea that, I don't know, Aristotle or Smith, right, might be expressing first and foremost the history of their society, the world they live in, as opposed to like pure ideation is, uh, I don't know, scandalous at St. John's. Ray, what do you think about this? You, you don't like historicizing? Well, not exactly not like historicizing, but it's just that, uh, well, yeah, like I agree that there, and actually like our program, like kind of like the founder of our program, like Jacob Klein. Like Jacob Klein, he's had this like very historicist view of like everything, right? He's like, there is a big break away, you know, like in, mod in modernity, you know, with every conception of science, even music, like with music, it used to be that music is like the cosmos, somehow the order of cosmos reflected in uh, melody, in the order of sounds. But now it's like, now it's like everyone is an artist, a genius, a creator. Like that is something like a creative source and that's like different from what used to be the case. What used to be like art or anything is just like imitative, but now it's creative. Um, and it's the same with like science, like it used to be about, you know, geometry is all about how the universal maps onto the particular. But now people no longer care about the particular images anymore. Like now people are just like, you know, we don't care about triangles. What we care about is a formula for a triangle, right? Like that's the thing. So I think like, I mean like St. John's is a history program. Like throughout the four years, it is to learn the, the, the big breakaway. That's, I think, what um, Jacob Klein and, you know, others, when they started this program, they had in mind. Like, even if we don't read 
historicism as such. Um, I mean, except like Hegel, you know, something like that. But like, we don't read historicism as such. But this program itself is founded on a historical basis. Yes, I think that's right. Yeah. So it's not that I don't like historicism. It's just that I feel like I I rather interpret it as not as some kind of like necessary movement of history, like somehow you know realizing itself, but rather it's just like yeah, some kind of like subjectivity or like just like somehow things being created,、um, you know, founded upon something that that precedes it. So. It's more creative for me than like than about like any kind of like necessary movement or anything. So that that's the basis. Like I'm not against like history. I have to disclaimer. Yeah, this is yeah. I was I was just gonna add to that that you know,、uh, like historicism in a lot of ways is just a historical because、mm-hmm. it's just like a random number generator that thinks okay now here's a new thing and here's another thing,、um, and you know bourgeois. Wait, wait, sorry, what does that mean? Like it, it's just different societies just springing up and then going away or something like that. That that's kind of what I meant. Like it's epicurean. It's just random. Is that clear? Like no. <laughs> historicism is just like I, I I think the phrase was always every、uh, society is equally close to God. There is no development. It's just different things. Or it's just at all the idea that it's possible to have like a totally like neutral objective view of history, like things happening rather than you know necessarily being forced to view it through like being a particular subject. I mean, the historicism itself is like historical, right? Like it's <laughs> yeah, like it sounds stupid, but like it's just like well, it's, yeah, like I, yeah. I, w- I was saying that because bourgeois society could claim to take. All of everything hitherto, and that it was kind of its story of of coming to being, right? Like that,、um, you know. That's why it was the Dark Ages, and why Carthage should have not burned. That humanity has gone through folly, but somehow it's worked out. And why has it worked out? Well, because it's produced us, right? This is like a bourgeois. This is why Adam Smith is saying, "How did bourgeois society grow through folly and injustice?" Adam Smith agrees with everybody on on campus that there were innocents killed in the you know peopling of the United States. He's not like that didn't happen. It did happen, right? There was folly. They did go after、um, you know gold in El Dorado. The point is, is that like it's not that they were affirming that that happened, but they could say out of all this folly and injustice and all sorts of things, actually it did produce conditions that now we can realize. Lend to some kind of direction in history that there was a purpose to this, that like, you know, contradictions, all of these things,、uh, they were kind of our、um, blind,、uh, our blind movement out of our unfreedom, out of our、uh, self knowledge, our self tutelage, our juvenile state. It was all the mistakes we made. But now, at least, we can recognize what ought to be, what could be just. You know, Smith is not affirming the world that he lives in,、um, and so consequently, we could make good on all the struggles for freedom that have happened in history. So I, I say that because you could read that all the way back into the first Homo Sapien, which is kind of what Adam Smith does.、Um, you know, you could. The R- Rousseau, Rousseau's like, why did we ever get consciousness? Isn't it like bad? It's bad. I know I'm going to die one day, and I think about all sorts of things when I'm going to sleep about what I did in second grade. It's horrible, <laughs> right? Like, why does this exist?、Um, so I, I just bring that up because historicism, to me, at least how I understand the phrase, is literally just they're just random things happening, and there's no relation. Every every thinker is relative to the time that they're、yeah. in, but there's not like any sort. Of- Any sense of like development, so that in like the bourgeois sense, like、uh, every everything from the bourgeois point of view is leading up to to the bourgeois point of view. From a historicist point of view, there's not really that sort of completion. Bourgeois society randomly、history. came into existence, right? Yeah, it's just another thing that that happened, and even the historicist point of view is again just 
the product of the society that produced it. So it becomes a bit of a contradiction. But. It, it can claim earlier things as leading to its development. That Christianity was an early form of equality because you were equal before God. And that Roman law and that you know Hellenistic Greece were all early forms of the idea. So bourgeois society sees itself as the goal of history. Yes. Yeah, and, and that's the justification, you know, like when Hegel's writing, it's in the counter-revolution. So he's saying it doesn't matter that we've been defeated in the battle, we're going to win the war because we're already here. And the reason I bring that up, I was going to bring up the famous Marx phrase, history hitherto is the history of class struggle. All of bourgeois society seems to fall back on exactly what it was ostensibly fighting. I mean, bourgeois society was not supposed to be a class society. And so the fact that this comes back it's like, this is going to sound silly what I'm about to say, but oh, you wake up one day and I never was going to be like my parents and I realize I'm like my parents, right? Like that's the silly way of putting it, but it's one of these things that it's supposed to be scandalous that bourgeois society falls into a class society, that the state comes back, right? That like, you know, the, the state was supposed to wither away in bourgeois society. That's why I was talking about Rousseau saying, well, the best state would be one where you show up once a year and it's like, Leave me alone, right? I mean, Adam Smith, like, why are all these anarchists Adam Smithians? Because Adam Smith seems to say, do we really need to do things violently? No, we can do things peacefully. Um, so to say, like, you know, Rosa Luxemburg, Rosa Luxemburg uh, links the class struggle to the 1830s. So she links it to the July Revolution. Um, and then, of course, the Chartists later. So to say history hitherto is the history of class struggle is a critique of all history. Bourgeois society was supposed to be classless and stateless. That is, the bourgeois radicals could recognize, not unambiguously, the will of society whereby it was possible to reflect on the general interest of society out of the cooperation of people. In this sense, the interest of society could be an object of, of public deliberation. Indeed, the only justification for the executive at all was the preservation of that freedom. If this could be done without force, then the need for a state was superfluous. This is why Marxists call anarchists liberalism in distress. It simply repeats the kind of bourgeois desiderata under a changed condition. Meaning, like, I, I have an anarchist with me in Philadelphia, and you know, they give like the kind of Kropotkin, Lysander Spooner justification, which is that all of you came to this teaching out of your own free will today. You know, we regulate things, things like that. Why do we need people violently telling us what to do? Of course, coercion, right? Like, isn't most of civil society already carried out in a consent basis? I think Lysander Spooner talks about kids playing a game of tag, right? Like they regulate each other, they follow the rules, they have some kind of complexity. Why can't that principle be extended to society at large? Like this is, you know, the anarchist argument, it's like a forceful argument. The phrase capitalist mode of production was short for the capitalist modification of commodity production. The phrase commodity production, meaning bourgeois society, a society based on the exchange of labor. This was a way of describing a historical contradiction. Marx and Engels, then as philosophes of the Second Enlightenment, were receiving what had changed and what had continued. In one sense, the problem is the contradictory identity of what had changed and what had continued. Meaning industrial potential is facilitated by bourgeois society. It undermines bourgeois society, it bursts the integument, as Marx puts it. And out of that crisis, people demand bourgeois society. So back to democracy, people are demanding the state make bourgeois society function, right? Give us a jobs program. Have us dig and dig a ditch. That's the Keynes thing. Thus, for Marx, the 16th century repeats in the 19th century. We seem to be living in both bourgeois society and industrial society, or two epochs at once. An easy question that one can ask was socialism possible? Was it necessary in Adam Smith's time? If not, then it was not yet capitalism. For Marx, capitalism only had a transient necessity or a merely historical necessity. So there's two different quotes I have from him. It only made sense, uh, 
It only made sense after the Industrial Revolution. For the Industrial Revolution, we ought to have developed into socialism and communism. And this is why we have the utopian socialists, meaning they literally, Robert Owen is saying, this is how the world was in Adam Smith's time. This is our world now. It's totally different. Follow me to New Lanark and have this you know, nice commune. Go ahead. Okay, I I'm, 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 no. I'm reading it. I was trying to preempt if you guys were about to say something. Go to the commune, Blaine. Go ahead. Go to the commune. <laughs> <laughs> Meaning socialism's not offensive to a bourgeois sensibility. It's just like the fulfillment of the potential of, yeah, it's a factory. You're being rational and you're studying science. It's a beautiful thing. Um, so the way that Engels puts it in his famous socialism, utopian, and scientific pamphlet is that socialism first just seemed like a natural deduction of upon the principles that were laid down in the French Revolution. And it's only later, really in the 1830s, that they come to recognize it as a symptom of the class struggle. And that's how Marx and Engels became friends, according to Engels. They both realized that the communism, that communism is not about the future, it's about the present. They're literally, the class struggle is producing this kind of crisis. It's bourgeois society turning on bourgeois society. And if you don't believe me, I'm going to read a letter now, very <laughs> dramatically. OK. So this is Marx from 1843. I'm sure many of you have read this letter. It's the ruthless criticism of everything existing. So in fact, the internal obstacles seem almost greater than, ex than external difficulties. For even though the question where from presents no problems, the question where to is a rich source of confusion. Not only has universal anarchy broken out among the reformers, but also every individual must admit to himself that he has no precise idea about what ought to happen. However, the very defect turns to the advantage of the new movement. For it means that we do not anticipate the world with our dogmas, but instead attempt to discover the new world through the critique of the old. Hitherto, philosophers have left the keys to all riddles in their desks, and the stupid, uninitiated world had only to wait around for the roasted pigeons of absolute science to fly into its open mouth. Philosophy has now become secularized, and the most striking proof of this can be seen in the way that philosophical consciousness has joined battle not only outwardly but inwardly too. If we have no business with the construction of the future or with organizing it for all time, there can still be no doubt about the task confronting us at present, the ruthless criticism of the existing order, ruthless in that it will shrink neither from its own discoveries nor from conflict with the powers that be. This is Karl Marx. I am therefore not in favor of our hoisting a dogmatic banner. Quite the reverse. We must try to help the dogmatists to clarify their ideas. In particular, communism is a dogmatic abstraction. This is Karl Marx. And by communism, I do not refer to some imagined possible communism, but to communism as it actually exists in the teachings of Cabet, Desimane, Wittling, etc. So the ongoing communist movement that already existed, he's calling it dogmatic. He's calling it abstract. And here's the super important point. This communism is itself only a particular manifestation of the humanistic principle and is infected by its opposite private property. So just to stop for a second, and you read this in the, the manuscripts, that you know, for Marx, communism is property turning on property. So it's bourgeois society turning on bourgeois society. So back to this point about the contradiction, this also goes to your question, is the proletariat for or against bourgeois society both at the same time? It's simultaneously trying to realize bourgeois society and overthrow it at the same time. Right, meaning, what whole, this goes to your question, what, what, what is, are we exchanging labor? We're really exchanging labor because nobody's going to let the full results of the Industrial Revolution actually take their course, because that would mean death, right? And death of our own doing. So it's one of these things that, why is bourgeois society held together? because of the working class. Like, they demand it to be held together, and yet they're also driving its self-undermining capitalism, right? It's, it's crisis, the whole thing. It's not like there is bourgeois society, and the proletariat's over here, and then they're enslaved to it. No, they are the problem. 
Uh, this is why Marx is imminent to the problem. He's saying the ruthless criticism, he's not talking about going on CNBC and arguing with you know, the news anchor. He's saying the ruthless criticism of communism. So the abolition of private property is therefore by no means identical with communism. And communism has seen other socialist theories, such as those of Fourier and Proudhon, rising up in opposition to it, not fortuitously, but necessarily, because it is only a particular one-sided realization of the principle of socialism. Meaning the crisis of capitalism simultaneously looks like the uh, violation of people's property rights and also the demand to abolish people's property rights. And because communism is a contradiction, that's why Marx can say you get these two sides of the contradiction all calling themselves communists. Right, so Proudhon's an anarchist. He's asked, are you for democracy? And he says, no, I'm an anarchist. Right, and the other side of it, I don't know, he mentions like Vitling. Vitling is like, communism's the brotherhood of man. You should love everybody. Right, and then Kebe kind of has like a utopian socialist aspect to him. But um, yeah, so this is Marx. Uh, Our program must be the reform of consciousness, not through dogmas, but by analyzing mystical consciousness obscure to itself, whether it appear in religious or political form. It will then become plain that the world has long since dreamed of something of which it needs only to become conscious for it to possess it in reality. It will then become plain that our task is not to draw a sharp mental line between past and future, but to complete the thought of the past. And I want everybody to pay attention to this last sentence. Lastly, it will become plain that mankind will not begin any new work, but will consciously bring about the completion of its old work. So back to this question earlier about like historicism or historical or capitalism, bourgeois society, industrial society. Marx is right here saying that when we get down to it, communism is actually the revolt of the third estate. It is the bourgeois revolution under changed conditions. And so that changes in a lot of ways what is the meaning of politics for Marx, that politics is not one of like just a new society, but it's actually kind of mastering this regression, that communism itself is a regression. Um, if you know from the manuscripts, Marx is like, what would a communist society look like? It will be perfecting the proletarianization. It will perfect capitalism, right? Everybody will be capitalists and proletariat at the same time, and not for perpetuity, but in order to actually finally deal with the problem, right? And so that changes the kind of meaning of, of politics there. And that's why he's saying like, uh, you know, I'm not for raising a dogmatic banner, not because I'm cowardly and don't have opinions, maybe someone takes it like that, but rather the problem's already here. It's literally there in the self-organization of the proletariat demanding communism, right? Communism's the riddle of history, right? All of history, the riddle of what, is, what was all this? Is it worse? Should we have never left the forest? Should we still be eating acorns? Instead, should we have remained homo sapiens and not become humans? What's the point of society? Is society good? Don't we kill people? Don't we enslave them? Don't we holocaust them? The whole thing is coming down to this question of what is this crisis, this kind of demand? And this is why for Marx, uh, you know, there's no capitalism without socialism because the very image of socialism is an expression of the contradiction of capitalism. So I always see like, you know, there's like the Stalinist thing of like slave society, feudal society, capitalism, communism, like it's a line. So that's, that's wrong in my humble opinion. I think that really misleads people about what the kind of problem was. I'll just give one more example and then I'll, I'll shut up and we can talk a little bit. Um, so two years ago on Penn's campus, so I live in Philadelphia, um, there was a debate between Yaron Brook of the Ayn Rand Institute and Richard Wolff, a Marxist economist. Brook argued for the rationality of private property. He would probably say free markets and individuality, but really it was, it was property, meaning you know the first like property, it's labor, 
It's the individual, Howard Rourke, whatever, this kind of thing. In other words, Brooke articulated bourgeois social relations. Wolf, on the contrary, argued for worker cooperatives and democratic rights. Essentially, he was arguing for the industrial side. Really, they represented either side of the contradiction. The phrase by Marx and Engels, proletarian socialism, was an attempt to articulate the practical organization of the contradiction. But without the presence of a proletarian socialist movement, it is hard to make sense of the conditions that gave rise to Marxism. The refusal to recognize this and to try to maintain the relevance of Marxism today, including and maybe most especially when somebody determines their own agenda against Marxism, right? Marx was a racist, Marx was bad on the women's question, Marx was Eurocentric, it really reflects how one considers Marxism. It turns it into a social theory or a philosophy or a method or even as Bas Carson Carr once put it, a toolbox. He said that on RT, I can find the quote. Ultimately, Marxism is as symptomatic of capitalism as inequality and unemployment. The need to provide a scientific socialism, a critique of the socialist movement, has proven to be the most spectacular failure in modern history. Marxism indeed did change the world, but not as intended. When Marxism returns today, if it's symptomatic of capitalism, we must ask ourselves to be true to Marx, to be true to the old war, this question. What is Marxism for? So I just wanted to raise those things, and I think we have seven minutes. <laughs> Questions? This is a question that I have been kind of wrestling with for, I guess, the last few months in plot plus. I think Christian and I, and we haven't directly um, you know, confronted it, but it's, I think something's been floating around. It's like thinking about the relationship between the Enlightenment as you know the sort of late self-consciousness of bourgeois society, and then that seeming to occur like right before the beginning of the Industrial Revolution. Um, and because I, I remember, I mean, I, I don't, you know, I don't, I don't want to ascribe bad ideas to Christian, but he, he raised a sort of question like could you know if if not for capitalism could bourgeois society have like gone on indefinitely which i guess i like found suspect but i didn't really know like how to respond to um so i, I guess if you could just talk a little about like what relationship you see between the emer like the emergence of bourgeois self-consciousness and like the, the industrial revolution yeah um so I have a few things. One I had mentioned, you know, traditional society could have happened forever, mm -hmm. right? Like there is, like to us today, it looks like it had to inevitably collapse. And yet there is something seemingly contingent about why did all these people run away into the cities and how did that like subsist for centuries to become something, you know, unto itself that could really challenge feudal society. And, uh, I say that because it's like, you know, there is this thing when Hegel says uh, the Owl of Minerva, it's supposed to be like, by the time you're recognizing something, it's already too late, and that even some second international Marxists kind of abuse it to be like, oh, Hegel knows like what's already happening, it's already the downfall. Um, you know, this thing about the Industrial Revolution is there's no reason to... Uh, suppose that it looked like the crisis of bourgeois society at the first. And that's why I brought up Adam Smith saying, oh yeah, it's the great manufacturers. Like literally Adam Smith, and Marx jumps on this later, he's like, yeah, there's a division of labor in society. It's a division of labor in the factory. What's the big deal? There was no big deal at the time. It actually was generally well-functioning and stuff like that. Um, the idea of socialism at the beginning, it wasn't like society's in crisis, it's rather how we're running this system in the factories is not great, and it could be done better. That's why I said at first it looks totally rational, meaning it's really only showing itself to be a social crisis when you start to get something like not only permanent unemployment, but the working class is organizing the unemployed as proletariat. So. Could bourgeois society have continued indefinitely? Um, 
Sure, because in a certain way, socialism is a regression. Um, you know, like the, the fact, we were talking earlier about uh, doing away with labor, right? So it's already Adam Smith's view that in the future we'll work one minute a week and all the rest of the time we'll be developing ourselves. Like the Jetsons, right? If you know the cartoon, that's like a bourgeois image of you know all the possibilities of a free society. So I think when people hear that, they instantly think of like there's something that somehow they had naturalized or like work was good even in uh, for someone like Smith. Um, like as like it's good to be in a factory and like working 10 hours a day that's not really what they had in mind they really did have that actually the progress of humanity would be working three hours a week working one hour a week everything that is uh, associated with communism is already the kind of desiderata of bourgeois society so i bring that up because the way that marx um describes the present in the grundrisse is he calls it a historical necessity so he doesn't say it was inevitable. Um, there was, you know, Adam Smith would be totally fine with like a future society relating no longer on the basis of labor. Like that wouldn't, there would be no reason that that would necessarily have to be a crisis. It becomes a crisis because in a sense that possibility for a different form of relating has kind of emerged, but it kind of cracks society in a way that has now put us in a kind of perpetual loop of trying to put it together and overcome it at the same time. Right? It's like why, um, you know, what is, how does Rosa Luxemburg put it? She's like, oh, everybody thinks the problem with capitalism is the bust when the market crashes and everybody's unemployed. And she's like, no, that's the potential for more capitalism. So it's really a problem that has to be overcome consciously. And again, back to the Marx point, that predicament seems to be what we arrived at, but there was no inevitable necessity that humanity had to develop down this path. And that's why he calls it like, a, this is something Chris will say all the time, Marx would be like horrified that we're still dealing with this. It really was an idea that like, if not in Marx's time, in Kautsky's time it would be done. You know, it wasn't supposed to like be there for the next almost 200 years. That's, that's the more horrifying thing. And that's actually, and this goes to maybe a point about platypus, that's why it really does seem to be like, okay, it's not like one can say we're not productive today or something like that, or we have to have one more war to really know we should have socialism. Like, it's actually one of these things where it's really posing itself as a political question, it's really an ideological question, as a question of the way in which people have adapted to the defeat of, of socialism. Right, like millions of people really thought it was truly possible in at the turn of the century, and they were n more normal than us. They like had a you know, <laughs> like it's like weird to oh you're going to a thing on Marxism that's like weird. It's we were talking about internet subculture. It's like an internet subculture thing right now, and it's not like I'm trying to say like I'm totally fine with Marx getting things wrong, but the problem is to me how how political movements have adjusted to that or adapted to that or have taught people about what was wrong with Marx. Like, obviously, Marxism failed. This book that I've thought about for over a decade, Das Kapital, that's a failed political project. The point of that was an imminent critique of the proletarian socialist movement. Right? I've talked about this in other settings. Like, it's not really like an economics. It's like that was the ideology of the proletariat. They were politicizing political economy. That's like a failed political project. How do I know that? Because Richard Wolff is a Marxist economist. <laughs> That's an evidence of the failure of Marxism is we have Marxist economics today. We have a question from anyone who's not a Platypus member. Can't censor me, Christian. <laughs> <laughs> um, I have a question. Um, do you think that suffrage is property? Do I think that suffrage is? Well, I think it follows from somebody's. Well, it's a right, so it's following from somebody's uh, right. Right. It's in other words, their political representation.
Maybe you could say more, like I might have misunderstood the question. Um, I don't know, I think I was just trying to connect what you were saying um, about labor being property to how the necessity for democracy came about. And I think I just... So, it, you know, it's like I, I think back to um, Locke or Rousseau of why is it that, you know, governments could ever have the legitimacy that they do, um, you know, in defense of the people that they're representing, right? Like the government for the people by the people. And so all I was trying to raise is what are the people that they're representing in modern society? Well, the first property is on, on labor in bourgeois society in a way that's not the case in various forms of ancient society. I guess to us we say it's land, but obviously they wouldn't say that in ancient Rome either. They would say it's like one's rank, right? I'm a citizen. Um, and so I was simply trying to relate the way in which modern politics reflects a different demos than it did in ancient society. I mean, in bourgeois society, everybody's a laborer. Like Jeff Bezos is a laborer. You know, it's like funny for us because we're like, oh, doesn't he hire all these people? And yet that's all of his wealth. That's the, that's the basis of it. I think you were also saying, right, that in a way the demand for suffrage arose as like the, it's, you know, the chances of kind of realizing your freedom in bourgeois society suddenly seemed to kind of dim. Right. Um, and so that it was, a, a, the idea that your freedom is in the political sphere was a, actually an unbourgeois idea. Um, so I, I wonder like whether Ms. Goldman, what you were asking was like, is suffrage almost like, does it become like a, if you lose like, I mean, you still have your property and your labor power, but if you can't realize that is like suffrage, does it become like something like a, a Assad's property, like something you get instead of that, or something like that, or, or it's something that becomes like similarly important, or that determines your status as like a member of society. Or yeah. yeah. To a liberal, right? Like under bourgeois society, property is the way in which you kind of cooperate with other people, right? Through the exchange of the commodity that's produced by your labor with the commodity that's produced by their labor. That's how we get along and work together, and so on. That's what, like, I don't know. Um, gives you purchase on society, right? Yeah. The commodities that you're exchanging with it. And that's in the, in the percentage of the proletariat, that's what kind of breaks down, right? Is that they have labor, which according to Locke was the source of all property, but they don't have property, um, right? It's just a contradiction. So they, they don't have it, the, the way in which they're supposed to be participating in society in the liberal view is falling short, right? And so then the vote becomes an ersatz form of property. What it's, what it's substituting for is the way in which property kind of made people cooperate in society and gave you a purchase on society. Now the purchase you have on society is I get to vote for the president who's going to coerce you to get along with everyone else. Democracy becomes a way of realizing the value of your labor. And you can't realize it in civil society. And you can even think, uh, you know, the, the provocative thing I think that like something that Dick Howard would raise, who's a guy at Stony Brook, would be that democracy is the commodity form. Meaning one person, one vote, this is like a reduction down of everybody to democracy. I mean, in a, in a sense, what happens in bourgeois society is everybody is reduced down to a human. Um, you know, the French for it is the, I'm not gonna pronounce the French, which is uh, the rights of the citizen versus the rights of human and the relationship between them. Right, so your human rights and then your citizen rights. Um, and uh, you know, another thing as well is like, I, this is something I forgot to say. Say around the American Revolution, there was like this idea of, okay, people who vote should be people who have property. To us today, that sounds like the, the most paternalistic, like racist, awful thing that's ever existed in human history. How dare them, it's worse than all the slavery that's ever existed is exactly that. And yet, it could make sense. Because it's like, yeah, why should you um, not expect, you know, your spouse or your employer to vote in your interest? Well, the only reason you would expect that is that all of a sudden, if you live in a world where your interest can't be realized by them, like that your employer perhaps doesn't realize your interest anymore. 
because you might change employers. They might get rid of you. Doesn't Smith already talk about that, though? Talk about what? Before the Industrial Revolution, talk about how the, the, the difference between the boss's interest and the worker's interest. Mm -hmm. Yeah. But that's not a political interest difference, necessarily. Interesting. Like, in other words, it, it goes back to when I was talking about the general will, which is that the employer interest and the employee interest, like he calls it the stockholder and then the worker, that's actually a form of cooperation is their competition, is their higgling, that's the term that he uses. It's part of forming, it's part of cooperating, it's forming the measure by which they both regulate each other, it's forming the general will, it's of interest of society that in the contract both parties are pressing their claims. In other words, it's in the interest of society that the employer is getting a surplus out of you and it's in the interest of society that the worker is demanding higher wages. And also in that formation, that higgling, for him that's a necessary constituent to forming the labor regulation, like the, the law of value, I hate to use this term, um, by which everybody else regulates themselves and judges themselves. That's why competition is a form of cooperation. I mean, even today, like, I don't know, like uh, America and China are fighting over semiconductors. It's actually a form of capitalist competition. It's not simply that they hold each other to the same standard or you're going to get like three nanometer semiconductors or something like that. Uh, but also they're setting the conditions by which they both compel each other to rise to the task. So the problem in capitalism is not competition. The problem is actually the way in which we undermine that standard by which it could be something productive and it's experienced as like a dog eats dog kind of conflict. So but Smith talks about how the bosses call on the state to crush the workers. Yeah. So the workers aren't able to actually compete fairly with the bosses. And so it, it seems like illiberal. Yeah, but so it doesn't seem like the the, the there's a unity of political interest between the bosses and the workers. Why well, would in, in, the 1770s. I mean, I would say that the interest there would be to also recognize the rights of the workers. But what if the boss is... I mean, what, what, what he really has an issue with is that the workers are not allowed to associate, but the employers are allowed to associate. And that's actually a civil question. Right? He's not actually saying pass through all this legislation. In fact, the whole book five is about, do we even need public legislation, really? Like maybe at this beginning, like yes, as we're entering into the division of labor, maybe there needs to be some kind of education. But we should keep in mind that the anarchists and socialists later, like they really read out of Adam Smith, like, oh, the eventual withering away of the state. You know, and there's even this thing, I know this is gonna sound silly today, there's an idea in the bourgeois revolution like people are going to become more reasonable because society is giving them a means to be more reasonable. Like, you know, I, I forget who I was talking to, but it's like, I'm, I'm hoping most people don't murder people because they're afraid of the police going after them, that they actually think there's something wrong about murdering somebody, that you're like robbing from yourself, you're robbing from society, right, that it's like bad. You know, and it's not like, oh, I would do it if the police weren't there. Like, that to me sounds like psychotic. Like, <laughs> that would make me worried. It's like, no, there's an idea that we're living in a form of society that despite the different interests, there's a general will. And so it's possible to see, like, okay, we're in, there, there's a reason, there's an interest of cooperating and not going through the course of forms to change things, but through the civil forms. Adam Smith is not saying that the employers don't have the right to demand lower wages. They can, that's completely in their rights. And they actually can associate if they want to. They can voluntarily associate. Or they can also call on the police to break up strikes. This is what, I mean, what ends up happening with the strikes. I mean, that's what Smith says. Right. Yeah. And so it's it doesn't seem like civil society is negotiating because the bosses are colluding with the state in order to prevent civil society from working it out. So you know, I would say also that when Smith is writing that, 
that's obviously a critique of that and saying this is obviously unreasonable. Mm, just like mercantilism is unreasonable. Yeah. And so he thought that society would grow beyond that unreasonableness. There's slavery in Adam Smith's time. Mm. The He's saying, isn't this unreasonable? The appearance that it's in the interest of the bosses to crush the workers when they're on strike is exactly what Smith is critiquing, right? That is exactly to him irrational. Just as with slavery, right? With the domination that the master exerts over the slave, that's irrational. It's like um, they're indulging their pride when they do that. In that same passage about cartels and putting down labor organization, he actually talks about how labor organization itself, how like unionization and these uh, strikes are a way that depresses competition, depresses right. production, all these things. Right, and this is why Marx and Engels are like unions are a symptom of capitalism, right? Like, it, you know, in other words, it would be one of these things that it would be preferable. Uh, like, it's also when we read Adam Smith, we can't help but hear the proletariat and capitalists, and they're just really not there. And that's why I brought up, was socialism possible or necessary in Smith's time? And the answer is no. And so that's step one to being like, we're talking about two different things. Not in a historicist sense of just a leap out of the 18th century, but as in a contradiction that emerges. Um, yeah, I, I like. What is Adam Smith like? Who is he defending through all wealth of nations? Labor, and so he's even saying like, look, when you do these things, like they do do them, but they're wrong. He's not affirming the world that he lives in. I mean, he's writing against you know, the East India Trading Company, which certainly existed at the time, and saying this is bad for everybody. And that might be hard for somebody in the East India Trading Company to understand at the time, because they're like, what do you mean? It's totally profitable. And he's saying, actually, you're harming your interests. And I guess, you know, this, this question came up because we were talking about democracy, right? And like the different interests in society. And for Smith, you know, I, I guess really the point is that for Smith, just, it wouldn't have seemed necessary that you need to, the way you deal with the situation where the bosses are calling in the police to break up the strikes is that you have to give the workers the vote. This is, this is what the class struggle means for Marx, by the way, which is that in the 18th century, they still had faith in public reason, that they could change things, like through, you know, articulating them in a way that today it's like we, we don't believe it. People write things all the time. Cares. So the class struggle for Marx means society is disintegrating. He doesn't say the proletariat are the glorified underdog. He says they are the dissolution of society. It's the first thing he ever writes on them. They are literally the dissolution of society. And it, you know, even the famous phrase, and I think this is what Blaine was bringing up. You know, oh, the workers have nothing but the labor to sell on their backs. I wish actually it's worse than that. A lot of workers can't sell the labor on their backs. Right? So it's not even like it's the working class, it's the proletariat. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. Uh, what else was I going to say? No, just the theory of class struggle. It's not like Marx is on one side. If you simply are on one side of the class struggle, not only is that just wrong, it's reified, it's also one of these things where you would simply be repeating the bourgeois revolution. Right? So, like with Abbey Siez, they're really saying the first two estates, you guys are parasites and you can either join us or get the heck out of town, right? That's not the same issue in capitalism with the class struggle. Mm -hmm. The workers are actually on all sides of the class struggle. Mm -hmm. And in fact, most of what is considered labor interests today are really the interest of capital. So the UAW strikes, right? Better wages, better working conditions. That's a demand for capital. Wages are capital. So the interest of like labor, of living labor, is actually much more Maybe it's more opaque today of what, of what that is meant, but yeah. I think people think proletariat labor interests, like the working class. And so then they put it back into a Smithian kind of view of society. Like, here's the other thing I forgot to say about bourgeois society. Bourgeois society was made for people disagreeing with each other. It's not like proof of a problem that people disagree and that they compete and that they oppose each other. I think this is what you raised, which is that the beautiful thing about bourgeois society is that it had this idea that it could all actually like work out, right? That there's a general will. 
that for Rousseau, there's no general will without opposing and even antagonistic forces. So the class struggle for Marx is not an antagonism. It's a self-contradiction of that will. Right? Like Everything Adam Smith says are antagonistic groups. Like, oh, I'm going to demand extra time out of you, and I'm going to demand higher wages. And this is like the dynamic of freedom for him. The falling rate of profit is good for Adam Smith. For Hegel, I mean, it's like, you know, contradiction. What does he put it in 1801? Contradiction is the principle of truth. Non-contradiction is false. I probably wrote that on the back of a napkin. It's like some miscellaneous thing he wrote. It's, it still kind of seems like the, the proletariat, especially as it becomes organized, um, is the nation. Like in the way that CS says, like you don't really need anyone else. And they're literally, you know, with all of their like civil social institutions and, and, and unions and everything, they're literally just creating an entire new society within the womb of the old. So it does kind of seem like CS all over again. Yeah. Where it's like, you don't need anything other than the proletariat. That's why Rosa Luxemburg said Bernstein, you're just repeating the old 18th century thing. She literally says, like, your image of a revolution is what the bourgeois revolution was, that they were just reforming over time, and then the political thing was the last act. So she's saying you're going from Marxism and liquidating back into liberalism. And the problem with that, you know, the difference between Marxism and liberalism is not principles. Marx, the only difference is Marxism recognizes the crisis of liberalism. It's, a, it's like a negative point. It's not like, well, liberalism's individuality, no. And Marxism's collectivity, God no. Do, well, I know you know this. I'm just saying that for the record, please, this is not what it is, right? And that's why Marx is saying there's multiple communisms because, you know, capitalism can look like both the oppression of the collective and the oppression of the individual because both are true. And yet, it's still the standpoint of the proletariat that shines light on the situation. The proletariat still stands in a place where that contradiction is kind of displayed most clearly. They embody it. In other words, in they... In a way that the bourgeoisie does not. And so that does seem kind of one-sided in a way. So I almost want to say there's the bourgeoisie and there's the bourgeoisie, right? Meaning there's like the 18th century, that there's no proletariat then. Meaning when we say, when you say the term bourgeoisie... I mean bourgeoisie after 1848. Right. right, so then we're talking, well, so they're done by 1848. So the second chapter in the 18th Brumaire, Marx just says they're done. They died. There's no bourgeoisie today. It's like Elon Musk is not bourgeoisie. Because people are not holding to like the bourgeois revolution as some kind of thing that's ongoing. I guess liber, well, not even libertarians really. They're, un they're kind of unsure and mixed on, there's a whole bunch of them. There's different flavors of them. Um, but really, like, you know, when you read someone like Baudelaire and he says to the bourgeoisie, he just means all the city dwellers. It's the classes in the city. And yes, in Paris in 1848, they were like, yes, the bourgeoisie versus the workers. This is your question. And that's why I brought up the Leibniz who said, yeah, that's what the rhetoric was, but it's not the same thing. So he makes a distinction between, as he calls it, the bourgeois spirit and the capitalist compromised bourgeoisie. So really it's like there's the capitalists afterwards. And even the capitalists is a false image because they're bearers of, of capitalist society. They're corollaries, as Marx puts it. They're kind of, they're not the same thing as Adam Smith's uh, stockholders. It's why Marx has, I don't know if you've read Capital, but one of the last chapters in volume three is the Trinity formula. So he's showing that the socialists today think they're in Adam Smith's time and they're in capitalism. And why do they think they're in Adam Smith's time? Because they talk about profit and wages, like Adam Smith did, and yet that's a necessary misrecognition of the problem. So profit is not the problem. There's nothing wrong with high profits. There's nothing wrong with low profits. The profit is inadequate to capture the problem of industrialization of, of capitalism. 
I think the way that Marx puts it in the Grundrisse is the miserable foundation, excuse me, yeah, the miserable foundation of stealing alien labor, right, of exploiting the workers, is miserable next to that produced by large scale industry. I mean, the problem with capitalism is exploiting the worker is not even like helpful. <laughs> It's actually not adequate to capture all of industrial society. So the problem isn't that the workers get exploited. It's that even if you exploit them more and more and more and more, it's still inadequate to capture that potential created by industrial society. I mean, exploitation is a bourgeois category also. And it's illegal in bourgeois society. How do I know this? Well, if you exploit somebody, they're going to take you to court. You'll be arrested. You're not allowed to exploit people. I think, am I wrong about that? Yeah. You're allowed to exploit people. I personally <laughs> Okay. All right. Well, we're still living in feudal society because he has a privilege over our rights. No, but what I was going to ask was, um, in every translation of the um, of the of the Communist Manifesto that I've read, which was written in the 1850s, he, Marx uh, and Engels, identify that the the proletariat and the bourgeoisie yeah. are opposing classes. Yeah. Right. Which d doesn't that seem to contradict the 1848 manuscript that you said, in which he says that the the bourgeoisie all dies in 1848. No, no. So, well, the manifesto is before the 18th Brumaire. But the other thing that, upon that, and that's why I brought up the lead thing, because actually he's saying in that pamphlet, yeah, that's what the rhetoric was at the time. And we know that to actually not be the case. Because really what's happening in 1848 is the bourgeois leaders are exactly violating their own revolution. The emergence of the recrudescence of the state is a violation of the ends of a bourgeois revolution. So I'm totally fine with that. I don't think it contradicts anything I, I said. Uh, Marx and Engels are imminent to the proletarian socialist movement. Um, they were politicizing the bourgeoisie. That's the language they used. I don't know. Lenin talks about the parasites. Are they literally parasites? No, but that's the right, you know, like there's a lot of stuff. Politics is pretty demagogical, right? It's not like this maybe goes back to the point about democracy. It's like, no, we want to overcome the need for democracy. Democracy is like demagogical and puts you against your neighbor. And, you know, it, it does encourage all sorts of like, you know, demagogues and stuff to rile up people. Am I not allowed to say that? It's bad. Like, I, politics is no. I want a civil society. Mar Marxism, I mean, like, I was reading on my way in here the, the book that was published, Anti Post Stone. Right? So it's this whole thing about, like, you know, is anti capitalism, like, structurally anti Semitic? Like, it's this whole argument about it. And yet, you know, through the history of Marxism, all sorts of rhetoric, it always does have this kind of, like, mm, it's a little, you know, a little awkward at times. You know, kill the, you know, what are, they don't say kill that, um, expropriate the leeches or something, or the blood suckers. It's a little like, uh, yeah, it was, it was like uh, politics is demagogical. And even Lenin, you know, later in 1920, he goes, we spent all this time teaching the workers to mistrust the capitalists. And then he's like, but all truths can themselves become absurd. I think he quotes Thomas Paine, actually, which is that like, all of a sudden you get all sorts of demagoguery where the Communist Party would be like, I'm a communist, you're a capitalist, I'm better than you. And so Lenin's like, obviously that's stupid. Like, that's some stupid stuff. And yet he's saying like, yeah, this was always a possible danger. I mean, it's wrong to say that the capitalist is the problem. They're not. You get rid of all of them. You could have co-ops, and you would still have capitalism. You said that the the nobody today is bourgeois anymore. Like Jeff Bezos, he's not bourgeois. But earlier, I made a note that you said that the way that we relate to commodities today is in a bourgeois way, right? Labor, I'm exchanging mm -hmm. money that I'm getting paid for my labor with for someone else's labor time. But that that is in contradiction with the way that commodities are produced today, which is industrial, right? Um, 
What did I mean by that? Bourgeoisie, nobody's leading like a, like carrying forward the kind of political ends of the bourgeois revolution, mm. right? Including even liberals today. Well, first of all, liberals today could just mean progressives. So FDR and Woodrow Wilson already say, yes, the kind of world we had in the 18th century is no more, and we need more state involvement. Um, meaning, like, that's what I meant by bourgeoisie. I wasn't talking about the social relations. Meaning, like, as a project in terms of what a liberal was like in the, in the 18th century, like, that to me is no longer, really. Yeah. But I don't, to be bourgeois, it's not, like, it's not like living a bourgeois lifestyle or having a bourgeois mindset. It's like participating in a bourgeois project. Is that what you mean? Say more. I guess when you said Jeff Bezos isn't bourgeois, you, you had some parenthetical, which was like, he's not, uh, he's not pushing forward the, the bourgeois project, right? The, um, which makes sense to me. And I guess I, I interpreted it as he doesn't have a bourgeois self-understanding. Yeah, or like, I don't know, like, do we have like a Thomas Jefferson today? No, in fact, the consciousness of the bourgeois revolution only continued to persist in Marxism. I mean, that's, what, that's why I read the letter, from, a letter to Ruga from Marx where he says, well, actually, the task that we're dealing with is, bourge, is the bourgeois revolution in distress. It's in crisis, and it's returning in the form of socialism. It's why a very young Engels says, well, actually, the revolution is kind of being carried on by the Chartists, that they're like carrying on the bourgeois revolution. And it's why, you know, Marx will just say something in the Paris Commune like, the watchword of liberalism is only going to be achieved through communism now. It's like, you know, small government, no bureaucracy. Marx is saying you have to be a communist now. That's what he says in the Paris Commune. So that's what I mean. Like, I, I just, like even neoliberalism, Neoliberalism accommodated to the state. It accommodated to Bonapartist uh, institutions. I don't know who a classic version of that would be, like Frederick Hayek or Milton Friedman. No, they, they made peace with the nation state. That's beneath a, a Kant. I, I, yeah, I still don't understand any of this. So, um is, are you saying that it's impossible that a libertarian today, let's say, who has not made peace with the state, who's not a neoliberal, that person even can't be um, have be advancing the, the bourgeois project? Yeah, I actually so I wrote a, a crazy article about anarcho-capitalism, even, which is really like, oh, we're going to overcome the state, we're going to privatize security. And, you know, to me, like, the libertarians and the anarchists, anarcho-capitalists, um, at least in what they, uh, I was going to say suggest, in what they demand, I don't think it's, it's possible based on how they think to get there. I think they consider the state as kind of a violent holdover that's kind of accidental, kind of coming from without. Um, but yeah, I, I think they're kind of stuck in the 18th century. But they are still kind of representing that bourgeois desire, right, to get beyond the state. I mean, the crazy thing is kind of all politics is reflecting some kind of bourgeois desire. That's the, the point about democracy, that it's all people demanding different parts of society to be true to their principle. Or like the workers are demanding bourgeois society. I mean, the capitalists are demanding bourgeois society. Um, I, I think I was going to say that I, I didn't read it, but like in Marx's view, nobody is pro-capitalism. You can't be pro-capitalism. The libertarians are not pro-capitalism. They're pro. They want bourgeois society. The workers want bourgeois society. What's the sense in which they're not bourgeois, though? Um, no, I, okay, so stepping back, I meant as like a political project, like a bourgeoisie, a George Washington, a Thomas Jefferson, that's what I meant. And I think that's being conflated with, don't people operate in, according to bourgeois social relations? But, but I think what, those still exist. What, what yes. is a political project then, that, like somebody like um, George Washington and Thomas Jefferson um, 
embodied or represented or advanced that like contemporary libertarians or I was also thinking of, of like the cosmopolitan vision, right? So maybe we can think about like the, uh, you know, kind of what seems to be happening right now that we have this like resurgence of like populism on the one hand mm -hmm. and then that is like, you know, opposed by like other factions, right? Who kind of want more open borders and, and really I think like, you know, where I also would say, well, isn't that in a way like a bourgeois vision, right? You want like a, maybe you, you don't, maybe you no longer believe that it's possible to get rid of the nation state, but you want like open borders, a cosmopolitan society, to some extent, like not only free movement of goods, but also of people. So in, I guess like, it's, it's the idea that, uh, yeah, what's the difference between like the sort of bourgeois project that like somebody like, I don't know, Thomas Jefferson, George Washington, um, maybe even still Lincoln, although maybe that's like a different generation, and you would say actually there's already something else going on there, represents that contemporary libertarians or, um, yeah, uh, cosmopolitans don't represent. So my experience, the, there's a few things I want to say. My experience with the libertarians is actually they're kind of, they have a, a porio when it comes to recognizing society. Meaning when they think of rights, they really think of it like an in, in individuated individual perspective. It's like our nature as people. And in that sense, they actually fall into a kind of a historical view because they're like, well, humanity just violated these rights for like hundreds and hundreds, if not thousands of years. And then we like figured out that that's bad. Like whenever I talk to libertarians, they won't quite accept that property is a social relation, that it's a right because I feel like they intuit if they did say that, they would give up the ghost that like, okay, then you're saying that society is the final executor mm. of, of property. And for them, that would be giving ammunition to the state to step in to expropriate your property, steal from you. They say things like taxes are, are theft, right? On the one hand, they're justifying it on the basis of bourgeois property because they're saying coercion violence, you've stepped in, you've taken my property. That's literal theft in a bourgeois sensibility. On the other hand, the basis of the state is also justified on the basis of liberalism. Not only simply as the final executor, like the guarantor of property, but you know what happens in 1848, and maybe the, the issue is I, I skipped over this a little bit too much, is that the class struggle leads society to collapse and the state steps in to save society and on the basis of liberalism, by breaking liberalism to save liberalism, right? This is why you know, the infamous phrase by Marx is the dictatorship of the proletariat. Now there's already been a dictatorship in 1848 and it was demanded democratically by people because the dictatorship that was in reference to like ancient Roman law, that in a state of emergency, it was not only right, but like just, for the state to save society from collapsing into internecine warfare. So the very existence of the state then, for Marx, is implying the continued violation of liberal society. And so when we talk about neoliberals today, they actually accommodate to the violation of their own revolution. Now the reason I brought up the anarcho-capitalists, and we don't really have to go down that much of a route, is that anarcho-capitalism comes out of 1848, as I brought up in some article I wrote, and it comes up in response to the June insurrection, where literally this guy Molinari says, the last monopoly is that on security, coercion. And so in order to emancipate ourselves, we should subject that to the market. And that's why anarcho-capitalists have this whole thing about private security, right? The market for security, this is the Molinari thing. And for me, the way that I, I wrote about this is that is a kind of demand for bourgeois society. It's a demand really for the social contract, like literally to exist in a almost on the nose manner that like I'm only going to enter into a community that I've literally signed a fucking contract with. Um, but it's, it misses why there is a need for that security in the first place. And that's why ultimately it falls below the bourgeois horizon. Meaning they still even accommodate to the crisis of society in demanding a market for security. Because they still can't explain why do those 
relations break down? What's the basis for that? And obviously, let's say we were living in, in Kapistan today. There would be plenty of violation of people's rights. We would get the same complaint. It would just be in every little community. right? Because you would still have the executive having to step in to, uh, how does Engels put it? The society admits that it can't self-regulate. The state, for Marx and Engels, is the running proof that society is crying uncle. It's why Walter Benjamin, someone I know many of you know, says the state of emergency is like the tradition taught to the oppressed. So it's not that there are crises of capitalism. Capitalism is a crisis. And it's been so perpetual that people have just naturalized it. So Herbert Spencer at the end of the 19th century says, oh, well, the state's just part of the differentiation of society. It's like the division of labor, right? It's like, yeah, we have people who do that, and we have the state. So that, to me, is like, yes, do the libertarians reflect the bourgeois ethos? But all discontents are bourgeois, because in a sense, all of them are reacting to some problem in society, and the standard by which one can judge that is bourgeois society. I mean, I, I didn't want to say the provocative thing, but like even groups that are seemingly very anti-bourgeois, you could still say to what degree do they manifest you know, a bourgeois discontent. But the groups that are pro-bourgeois or see themselves as such are still not, do not really have a bourgeois outlook because in one way or another they do not grasp society. Yeah, that's why I brought up Yaron Brook, that Ayn Rand person. Right? Like he talks about individuality and all these things, and there's just a sapori of where does all this, how does this become possible and stuff. And I think I asked him the question, and he just went into his spiel. Like, they, him and Richard Wolf had their spiel, and it didn't matter what you said. What's your favorite ice cream? It's just like in a spiel. What's going to be the response? So then what's, what's peculiar maybe about, um, like, um, bourgeois society um, in, when it was revolutionary still, um, which it hasn't been since 1848 at the very le latest, I guess. But what was then originally really revolutionary about bourgeois society is like this, that it's self, I mean, I guess like it's self-consciousness was a little bit odd in one sense, right? In the sense that maybe in the sense in which it conceives of itself as the yeah. goal of history, right? That's a little peculiar. <laughs> but in another sense that it's self-consciousness was, um, adequate in the sense that it did understand the idea of society and that was what it kind of wanted to make happen Yeah. in a way that hasn't been the case since, well, I guess like now I want to say since 1848, but maybe that's just putting a random date on it. Yeah, well, and 1848 is revolutionary. It's just revolutionary and counter-revolutionary yeah. at the same time. No, like uh, in the preface that Engels writes after Marx's death to capital, and he's talking about all the footnotes in Capital where they're quoting some Italian you know, mercantilist from whatever. He just says, all of these were adequate consciousness for their time. So he's saying when Smith wrote this, that was appropriate. Like that's, you know, that's their, it's their Hegelianism. It's like, uh, you know, in other words, they can ask the question of like, you know, that was appropriate for their time. Um, and perhaps the more interesting thing for Marx is that why do those discontents repeat themselves when they've become inadequate? And that's where you get the term bourgeois ideology. In other words, bourgeois society has become ideological in a way that it wasn't with Smith. So either you can say it was an ideology then or it's ideological in a different way, however you want to you think about it. And that's where the phrase capitalist mode of production, the capitalist mode of the production of commodities, the capitalist production of bourgeois society. So all these technical, neutral sounding terms are their ways of putting a contradiction. You have the capitalist mode of producing bourgeois society. Should we dissolve and wrap up and discuss freely? Yeah, I think so. I think cool. so. Okay. Great.